this is going to be your most recent episode. I can hear myself, by the way. Oh, wait, it's, it's the stream's open. It's all good. It's all good. That is working, man. So, Boomer moment. You checked it. Working. Good job. It's all good. I'm, I'm under the weather today. I got a bit of a cold. But like Michael Jordan, we still turn up for the finals game. It is Worlds. So, obviously, we have finished the Swiss system now, Monty. As usual, there's going to be a collection of bingo card moments here. Probably complaining about the format, <laughs> randomized draws, a team. If any team, spoiler, any team ever gets out of Swiss without beating an LCK or LPL team, going to complain about them. Not just now, <laughs> get ready for years. Get ready. Yeah. Get <laughs> buckle in for that. You're going to complain for years. years maybe maybe like a decade about the world's format yeah. at this point in time. By the way, I, I showed you someone did actually do a, a similar thing to what I've referenced Lopez did in the past in Counter-Strike when we got Swiss System, which is he once ran a simulation that showed if you actually did have like the top eight teams in the world, would they get out if you put them in Swiss? And the problem is there are there are certain scenarios where they the top eight can't even get out, even if they all win as the favoured team, etc. Like the draw just means eventually you get one where like the ninth one makes it instead of the eighth or something like that. And basically, someone did a similar one for League. So that means though, Monty, technically two steps statements have to be updated about Swiss. One, it's actually now technically easier than ever to get to the playoffs of Worlds. Yeah, that's right. You might think, but that's not true though, because you know, they're fought. No, no, because you can just do this. Happened twice now. Two NA teams, two NA number one seats, the home of Riot Global. Nothing looking to there, folks. <laughs> All seems above board to me, folks. The region that's dying in love viewership, folks. Give me a fucking break. But anyway, that turns out the actual secret, Monty, if you want to get to the playoffs of Worlds, isn't like update the meta, stay on the edge so you can draft and do a lot of flex picks and play, you know, sort of like Yu-Gi-Oh! in the draft with them, like LS likes to. Don't do that. Don't do what actually um, people like TL did. Learn macro, study all those boring nerd concepts, you know, fucking X's and O's, you know, fucking, oh, I've got to run a fade route here, like none of that American <laughs> football shit. You just play the game. What you should do, Monty, is this. Just pray, get a little fucking, a little rabbit's foot, um, what do you do? You try to see a certain amount of crows each day in the sky. You just look for omens. Because luck is the best way. It's proven now. The best way to get out of the Swiss system is to just get incredibly lucky and don't draw anyone from the LPL once again. Or if you do, lose to them. So, so if you can somehow draw Gab and Team Liquid and Mad Lions, that's the secret, it turns out. So None of that other shit. That's so the, 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 the point of the like eight monkeys on a team, you know, eight teams of monkeys versus eight teams of professional players is merely to point out that in the absence of seeding guys this is what happens which is that eventually you get like a f over 50 percent likelihood of the one of the two two matches being played between two teams of monkeys and therefore monkeys getting into the top eight right now obviously we double have got really confused he was like but do the monkeys even know how to play league ball? that's the question like, he got I hung up on it. that he got hung up on that <laughs> he wouldn't have he wouldn't have double lift double lift struggles with abstract yeah. concepts you know <laughs> like I, I, I feel like i've watched enough of his content i don't even need him to react anymore. I can just imagine a sort of virtual AI double if that reacts for me and I just know what his response will be. So it's great. It's all good. I would rather talk with Chat GPT than Double Lift though in a conversation. Uh I I'll but to put this out there, guys. So basically, because in the absence of seeding, what happens is now if the Swiss system were properly seeded, and not I'm not just talking about at the start. At the start is good, but also if we were to keep those seeds. So, for example, after the first round, you take the 8-1-0 teams, right? And you take the 8-0-1 teams, and then you say, who is the highest seed of the 0-1 teams and who is the lowest seed of the 0-1 teams? And then you have them face off, right? And so on and so forth. You, who is the highest seed of the 01 teams? Who is the, the lowest seed of the 01 teams? Have them face off in the next round, right? So this is this makes it more likely that the more skilled teams advance. And that's really one of the issues here because we get problems like the FlyQuest slash Team Liquid conundrum, which is frankly just bullshit. And yes, I know, guys, part of this could have been alleviated by the fact that MDK did not, in fact, have to lose to wildcard teams PSG Talon, True. which, I mean, PSG Talon is, we all know Taiwan is actually a good region, yeah, and legit. historically they performed a lot better than many, than NA and EU many times, at least their top seed has. And, but, like, did they have to lose 2-1 to GAM? No, they did not. And because that happened, we ended up in a situation where then TL played GAM, so TL's path, you know, 
sure, they played LNG and Weibo, but FlyQuest managed to play literally, you know, the only wins they had were for, versus GAM, PSG Talon, and then Team Liquid. And they're in the top eight, which is obviously just completely fucking ridiculous. Um, so that should not be allowed to happen. But in the absence of either starting, you know, a accurate seating at the start or matchups based on seeding as this goes forward. The thing about this format of Swiss is that it does make it incredibly likely that the like the top like six teams will almost certainly go through the quarterfinals where it gets squirrely is one or two teams are going to be like on the cusp and you could be in fact the 10th best team at this tournament and make quarters because the last two slots can be determined pretty much by RNG, which is basically what we saw here. You know, did G2 deserve to go out versus BLG? G2, I would say, probably could have beaten any of the non-BLG teams, right? And then we also run into the problem of we can't have the same matchups again in the 2-2 round, which is a rule that should be eliminated. You should be able to rematch in the 2-2 round because it would have prevented G2 from potentially playing Weibo, which I think was a, a beatable team way, for them. And indeed, they had beaten earlier, right? The other obvious team, if I'm D+, I'm like, what is this draw? Like, so FlyQuest gets to beat GAM, <laughs> PSG, and Team Liquid. But because I can't beat fucking LNG, Top Esports, or Weibo, I'm not allowed to play. Like, what, 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 we're not even playing the same game. What even is By this? By the way, they did beat FlyQuest. They did beat FlyQuest as well. Uh, and they don't sure. actually get to get into the quarterfinals. Oh, because they're, um, the, they're the nightmare draw. Yeah. they had the, I mean, they do suck, and I do hate them, so I'm not as cracked Still better about FlyQuest, that. Man. Still better than FlyQuest, man. <laughs> Still better than FlyQuest. But really... I think, Thorin, that what we should be doing is we could get mad at Swiss. And I do want to get mad at Swiss, obviously. But the real problem here, once again, goes back to Adam, which is not that's not some biblical concept of it it's the original sin yeah, was, exactly. in fact, <laughs> you know, just original just sin just caused conceded. caused the corruption <laughs> yeah. of the idiots who run this format at Riot Games. And so therefore, due to the fall of man. We have this shitty Swiss format. That's not where I'm going. I mean that Adam literally, by being an idiot, prevented BDS from advancing to winter finals. And now we have to deal with this garbage ass MDK team that is at Worlds, who is then losing to minor regions and therefore causing the butterfly effect of FlyQuest versus Team Liquid. Speaking of friend of the show, Adam, did you see his incredible... Oh, Self-awareness. I love it. Because the best part is, first of all, he's not even right. Like, if you don't know, in the video, he basically says he thinks, like, him and Broker Blade are, like, the top two by far and all that jazz, <laughs> which isn't even plausible right now. Like, obviously, there's, like, irrelevant spoilers better than Botan. you, man. has owned you every fucking time he's played you. But what he means by that is, like another young idiot, he's mistaken the fact that his team wins the game at the end of the game for he must have outplayed the other top player, which is obviously not the case at all. But no, <laughs> the worst part about it was that he genuinely doesn't seem at all aware that, like, stories will get out there in the scene about you if you like this behind the scenes, especially by the way. Here's a funny detail people won't notice, Monty. You know when you see loads of coaches do thing I always criticize them for, where they take the player that was like a sub or like a challenger player in their era in a team that they didn't want to put in the starting lineup. But now that they're not the coach anymore, that when they seem get promoted, you know, some desperation play in LCS on week eight. And they're like, oh brilliant, I'm glad he's getting his chance. And you're like, you would have never fucking played him, mate. But what they mean by that is I actually vouched for this guy like he was good or he was trying hard and he wants to improve in the same ways they'll be biased like that monty what plebs like adam don't realize is mate the one type of person coaches will definitely spread the word about is dickhead players ones that make it a nightmare to be the coach ones that ruin the fucking environment in the team the ones that come and do like power plays and fucking demand it that's exactly the player i can promise you they go and tell the other coaches about so it's not even just about bds like if here's the problem adam really has it's not that he's kicked out of bds it's that he got kicked out and i actually think he genuinely thought like right <laughs> Who's coming for me then? It's Who's like the coming phone just with the bag? Ring. Yeah, this is, the phone just did that stationary, no ringing whatsoever. It's just like, show a luck, isn't he? Because he's got, by the way, he's got everything going against him, not Monty. He's not that young anymore. He's played a, a bunch of years now. He's had his chances. He's got this rep that he's still got actual problems in this year after all the other things as well. And then lastly, he's just not actually that good. Like he is good. Put it this way. He can be top half in LEC. Sure. But his problem is he's trying to act like 
worse than forgiven. And he isn't forgiven. Bro, forgiven actually was like a pretty naturally talented player, guys. There's a reason people get giving him chances. If you're if you've got Adam as your choice, you do just go with the RL player or the old player that's just good. Like you don't need this attitude. I think it's too much of a negative. He doesn't get it, mate. He doesn't get it, sadly. No, I did find would, that a bit sad though. Yeah. You, I thought you would he would thought, just more be like, fuck everyone, but he just doesn't get it. He actually is unaware of why he's in the league. He you it. would have thought after the Fanatic Worlds incident that there would have been some sort of a awakening within Adam about his own attitude slash personality, but it didn't happen then. And then it got so bad in BDS, they had to bench him for a fucking semifinal match. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's obviously completely ridiculous. So I, I don't know. You you really have to be talented to be that much of an asshole. And unfortunately, yeah. his you you have to you actually your talent has to exceed your assholeness. And his assholeness currently exceeds his talent. Unfortunately for him. No, that's what he doesn't get. Is when you hear those famous stories, da doc, forgive it. Notice all those players, by the way, are just straight fire at what they do. South made, they do have like crazy hands or they're like a head on the some go, or even like being an arsehole is like channeled into their aggression in the game. Like, I don't think he gets it. Like, what's sad is it makes you realize he must have a very weird conception of who he is as a player. Because the joke is he thinks he's irrelevant or something, some like super stable, like you must play around him. I don't get it, mate. I don't get it at all. <laughs> and I'll also say this because a lot of people obviously are flaming that in that move, like 113 is coming back in the team. Well, 113 was one of Strikers' players. Kami Corp. If anything, Adam, that shows how much you fucked up, dickhead. He likes to bring in people he's worked with already that he knows. So that means when you're kicked, that's like saying, please, I don't ever want to work with this player again. <laughs> that's You took your one fucking ally, you imbecile, and you actually turned them against you. Like, well, well congrats. Yeah, Enjoy that guy, playing that that guy yeah, didn't kick you this year. Your coach didn't kick you this year. He I benched know. you as a punitive measure, and apparently things didn't get good enough for him to keep you in spite of a pretty successful year outside of the world's qualification for BDS. Um, so disappointing perhaps to some, not disappointing to me. I mean, I, I look forward to an LEC without Adam. I mean, the funny thing is, if you look at their team, they're obviously bringing in the relevant, apparently. It doesn't look like it'll be a bad team. Like, I think it looks like it could be pretty good. <laughs> sure. Adam, I, I do think it was a liability sometimes. I think he added certain methods where he was good, but I would have much rather had a stability. Remember, think how good they were at team fighting, bro. If you bring in someone like Irrelevant, I could see them getting really good, actually. So I'm, I'm not that out on that lineup. I know the people are down because of the 113 angle. I thought he was all right in Astralis. So well, let's wait and see. He's with his real coach now, so we'll see what is unlocked inside. So I think the thing about Irrelevant being added to the BDS lineup is he just fits the mold better of what BDS wants to do, which is play a strong fundamental macro game, right? And I think the problem with Adam is even though he expanded his champion pool this year, he's not the same player that like literally couldn't play Rumble to save his life a year ago at Worlds. Oh. Um, he did have improvements in, I would say, standard meta picks. The problem is, is if you're a striker and the way that he wants appears to want to coach BDS is that he doesn't want to have to jam the the square peg through the round hole, right? Or figure out how to best utilize an unconventional player. It really just feels like he wants to play standard bread and butter macro, you know, macro League of Legends. And he wants a versatility of a player and possibly a weak side player in order to do that. Now, is Nuke the guy who's going to get you over the finish line when it comes to winning LEC? No, but the there's not a lot of mid laners out there that I think that they could go and get at this point in time who would change that for them. Obviously, we'll talk about it here, but Humanoid looks fucking terrible. Um, he had a just a major collapse at the World Championship, where typically in the past he has at least mired my, like mildly redeemed himself by like performing better at internationals. Um, but he, this guy is just so completely checked out. So who's next on the list? Bro, like Jackie? you know how much like... I had to suffer? I had to sit there, right? As I have all my bet on Fnatic to win that series. Because I'm thinking, well, fuck it, we've got a chance. And then I just have to watch Humanoid lock in, swing, game three. Like, <laughs> why? Why does this happen to me? Why do I... Every time I've gone against this fucker, he's had like the one good international game he has every year that keeps people just naively hoping he's going to make it. Because, mate, he did not turn up at all this year. That whole thing of like, he always turns up in last year. He didn't. He didn't. He was bad. He actually just, was bad. Yeah. And we can talk about Fnatic now and transition this because I do think the, the people will meme on the Swain game because obviously it's, a, it's an unconventional meta pick. I do think that it is probably possible to play Swain in this meta. If you consider the number of 
low range compositions and, you know, three, four melee compositions that teams are running. Swain is good. If you're playing into that, right? If you can get a lot of value off of his, you know, close range HP tank tanking, it can be good. Um, the the problem here, Thorin, is we're trying to play it into Ari and Ezreal. And it's like when your composition is Jax by Swain, Ziggs, and Rel, and you're playing into Nar Skarner. Ari, Ezreal, Rakan, if you try and engage, like, first off, where's the follow-up for a Vi engage? Is it a Zigzult? You know what I mean? So it's really hard, I think, to kill people on Weibo. And at a certain point in time, it's very difficult to lock them down in a way where you're going to kill Ari or Ezreal with the composition because it's like half dive, half range. It's very weird. And... You you just can't kill anyone. And also, you're just never going to deal damage to the back line that you actually care about if you're Swain. Um, I just would not have picked it, you know, into this composition. Might it be good into some, like, Yone mid quad melee comps? Possibly. Uh, but it's not good. I mean, it this. looks like it's just a scrim pick, isn't it? They just did something in one scrim that worked, and they just pulled it on stage or something stupid, it looks like to me. Well, I think it probably worked in a different scenario, but it just isn't part of the identity of this composition. And I think that one of the big things that we're seeing at Worlds is a bunch of teams drafting some really funky comps, especially when teams pick Vi. It's not that I think Vi is bad per se, but what I do think is bad is picking Vi when half your team is like trying to run disengage or play from range, and then you have two carries that are going in. I mean, D plus was super guilty about this in the game that they played against in the game three, they played against Weibo where they're running Yone Vi, but then they're also running MF Gragas. And it's like, what does a team fight look like in that case? Not only do you have MF and Gragas ult anti synergy, but those are champions that want to play back, that want to kite, that want to, you know, Gragas wants to separate the team. MF wants to have them grouped. And who are you diving on the enemy team? Like the Zaya pick has been really good at dealing with this, which is why we're seeing the uptick in Zaya bans as well, because it's a it's an excellent answer to the Vi being selected. But teams really need to figure their shit out. And if we're committing to a dive comp, we have to go all in on that. We can't just split the difference. So I do think it's awkward. You know. Also, didn't you notice that the real problem with Fnatic in this tournament, Monty, is if you go and look, I'm going to say in probably over half the games, they're in the game at some point. Like, they get some kills, they have a skirmish that's going all right, they have a player that maybe is like farming okay, but bro, they have no knockout punch at all. Like, this team always at the end is the one that will just fail and then lose the game. Like, they never actually get it over the line. Like, like I'm, I'm going to make fun of Team Liquid later for doing that. We almost won that. You didn't, though. You don't, you don't win any of the games that matter. But Fnatic's just as bad, mate. They also put themselves in these scenarios where, like, hey, they could do the upset here. And then, like, except for if it's a BL3, they'll get one game. That's it. They can't ever win these fucking matches, mate. Like, they actually are. That's why it's a bummer that the rumor is they're going to re sign Oscar and in, et cetera. Bro, they need more teeth in this team. Where's the. <laughs> like, they're, you know, people build this team, Monty. This isn't even true. It's like, oh, they don't have good macro, but they've got like really good hands. What are we talking about? Who has really good hands? What, Humanoid and Razor? <laughs> Who else? <laughs> Who are we talking about? Oscar Renin's all right. He's not bad. Noah's like okay. Jun Jun's okay. Is not, yeah, the problem is they're not really that good at what they do, though. Like, Oscar Renin isn't good enough in lane. Noah's just a fucking puss. Like, you've got to change someone on this team. You the, the, pro this the problem is, is that they time, have, it. they don't have two brain cells to rub together. Explain to me how we can enter a game with Ziggs and three, tele three teleports in the final game, and we are TPing Ziggs bot to give up mid turrets, that we they are pressing into our base and we are not using Ziggs ults to clear waves, and we're just giving up turrets for free. We're not clearing waves. We're not doing anything with Ziggs ult. We have no idea how to play the map, in spite of the fact that we actually have three TPs in this game. We are TPing into the wrong locations and we are not clearing waves. It's terrible the way they play the game. They give up tons of objectives for, for nothing. They don't use the tools that they have to play the map. They're garbage. And there isn't somebody on this team. Jun, Jun is, 
How much English does Judd even speak at this point in time? He's relatively new to this roster. Razork and Humanoid and Oscar and clearly cannot call the shots in this team. Right? They clearly can't do it. So does Judd need to be replaced? Like, tell me what the answer for Fnatic is because they lack all identity when it comes to having any kind of presence on the map. Well, it's true. They have not, they're not existent shot calling. So, I yeah, I mean, this team is, man, this point. <laughs> like, and also they just looked like they had given up by the final game of the Weibo series. Like they didn't even care. They weren't even checked into this game. They weren't going to use any of the tools that they had to tr try and prevent Weibo from just way, enforcing their will <laughs> upon them. I don't know if you saw this, but it, it never ended, Monty, the suffering. The person who did the most damage to the brand of Fnatic this world this wasn't even a player. It was whoever the fuck's working in their media department. Bro, they just kept putting out pieces of media that were almost like sabotage of the whole org's image. So they put out <laughs> one piece of media where it was about the Jun pick, where right. it makes it even worse, bro, like in it, like basically they're all just like, and it's, I think it's implied that the coach just overruled everyone or something like that, something meant like that, which by the way, I'm fine with, but you know how fucking players are like, Oh, the players should make the choice because that's what fans are like. And then they did loads of stuff. And every piece of media that came out just made it worse and worse and worse. It's like, oh, what are we doing here? Like, this, you don't know how bad it's all coming off. Like, and now now everyone thinks your coach is incompetent. Your fucking players can't trust each other. Oh, it's mental, mate. It's actually mental how bad it was. Yeah, and, and the last thing I think any fan wants, including Fnatic fans, is to run back this roster. And it appears that that's what they're trying to do. Because Fnatic got this boondoggle of a contract on Humanoid that they just can't escape from. And it doesn't end until the end of next year. So it looks like we're just going to get another fucking year of Humanoid when there isn't anything to motivate him. Razork is signed for another two years to this team. So what's the fix here? Because they, they literally can't get rid of Humanoid because he's too expensive and nobody wants to buy him because his performance is shit. And it's clear that he is... As it's not a lack of talent for humanoid, it's a total lack of motivation. It's a total lack of motivation. Well, here's the thing I told you, I even heard on this past one that, I, that at some point he did just want to go to any when he thought you could go get the bag there and like just sort of like be like, lol, just make the money. Like, he wasn't even someone who was like hyper focused on like win worlds or some jazz or even some like lofty idea, you know, being one of the greatest players of all time. It sounded to me like he didn't give a fuck, mate. It's sad though, isn't it? It is actually sad because that it's why I had to tell the people on my Discord this, like. You're not going to like this, but this is absolutely, absolutely what is going to happen. I told them because they saw that news where it was like irrelevant goes to BDS, and they were like, "What the hell? Why, why does he go to Fnatic?" And I'm like, "Oh, boys, you don't get it. If you don't know how Fnatic thinks, their guy is going to see all those finals and making it to MSI and Worlds and go, what are you talking about? We're right where we want to be, it's just behind G2.' And it's like, "Oh God, I, I knew this would happen. I literally knew it. Now I'm just scared. The question is, do they bloody resign Noah? Please don't." <laughs> If you know free time Noah, look, here's the one good thing. Surely some other team comes along that's better than Fnatic. That's the one upside, right? Maybe it is BDS. Maybe they make a new team with upset somewhere. Surely some other team defrauds Fnatic and that's okay. Because Fnatic's fourth best, I'm okay with that. Let them fuck them. I don't know why Razor resigned, by the way. That's mental, personally, but whatever. Maybe they gave him a good deal. Might just give him a lot of money or something. I don't know. Um, but it's good that this, this team's run ended when it did because, like, it, there are a couple teams that... I, I mean, I'm fed up with Weibo as well, so I was kind of fine with whoever won this matchup. Uh, I will say at least Weibo, I think, had a better showing against D-plus Kia and looked like they were powering up for this phase in the tournament, but they still have a lot of intrinsic problems, particularly at the mid and support positions. But, I mean, I, I could do... I, the fact that I'm going to have to watch Weibo in quarters instead of G2 is deeply upsetting to me because I just wanted... I wanted Fnatic gone, I wanted D-plus gone, and I wanted Weibo gone. And that's what I cared most about happening because these lower-seeded Asian teams have just been very unpleasant to watch. And G2 at least has shown a level of creativity and upside to this tournament. Uh, and I thought they probably deserved to make top eight, but they didn't get the chance because they had to play Billy Billy. Who also, by the way, if we want to talk about Swiss results... Billy Billy, also the number one seed from China, managed to make it out of Swiss without beating a team from China or Korea because their wins were versus MDK, then they lost to LNG, then they lost to T1, then they beat PSG, and then they beat G2. So I won't say that their run has LG, not been... LG, confirmed fraud. <laughs> fraudulent confirmed fraud. either, right? <laughs> it's, it's not great. 
It's not great. BLG, the FlyQuest of Asia, as we call them over here <laughs> on the show. <laughs> At least FlyQuest has had some fun picks, which we'll get to. Like this, this was a. And by the way, on that note, this was an entertaining yeah, last few days for FlyQuest. We also do need to talk about that too, which is look, yes, BLG did indeed go through and they did beat G two and they are in the playoffs. But I'll tell you what, Monty, if you watch the series they had against <laughs> PSG, bro, that first game they they should probably have lost that game. Oh like, yeah, they were in they were in terrible position. They did that thing where it's like essentially this is why them getting out doesn't make anyone that scared yet because if you look like you say they've just beaten all the like lesser teams and even then by the way it wasn't like they were just breezing through people true they could have beaten t1 but they didn't actually blg doesn't look powered up yet mate it doesn't it still looks like they, they could be a little bit sus but they got a few days to figure it out i mean if you days. if you are an on fan at least you would have been encouraged by the last best of three that he played yesterday because his Alistair game was actually really good. He did some very clever things, including like faking a recall and staying in a brush for like a minute to just, you know, kind of ambush Hansama and Mickey X on the bot side. That was really fun. He had some very good flashes, some very good engages on Alistair. Uh, but he's had a terrible tournament and he played awfully against PSG Talon. So he's still way up there. We'll get to you, Impact, and you possible Dade Award winner. Uh, yep. we'll, we have to wait for quarters to finish, though, to see if BLG, like, washes out uh, and on looks super bad again because they're coming in as an underdog it, versus yep. HLE for sure. Yeah, and Delight is having it. a very good tournament, and he may look make on look really bad. You know, that's a that's a tough bot lane to face. Thing is, as well, this is the reason why On was always going to be someone, Monty, who was like right at the top of the stocks to be the Dade Award winner. Because if you ever see his style of play, he really is like the Chinese Hillisang. He doesn't just do the int where, like, you know, he fails like a flasher. He does the int where he just goes like straight into the middle of four people and they all just turn on him and just kill him instantly. Like, I fucking love it. It's so criminal. Because you can see, like, when it works, obviously it's going to be sick. He's going to do like a rel knock up or something. But, like, when you fuck that up, it's so odd. It's like I was saying, Counter Strike. There's, there's like a joke that like for some reason the observer guy is always on you when you do like the really bad whiff where like you miss the <laughs> easy spray on someone and then you're like notorious among the community for being shit even though it was like just a bad timing that the guy was watching and that's what Ons Ints are all like he doesn't even do it that often but when he does they're so memorable so I'm keeping my eye on him mate because <laughs> the part people haven't noticed is to be fair I actually like it's not bad in terms of the bracket draw but the part about the top part that's interesting is unless BLG gets it together there's going to potentially be a surprise finalist. Maybe it will be on life for fuck's sake. We all made fun of Zeka for all those years. Could actually be fucking Zeka in the world's finals. Again. What then? <laughs> yeah, I mean, part of me hopes that this is the the Scout and LNG Dark Horse run because that could be really fun. Uh, fire, yeah. uh, but, I mean, at this point in time, if you've watched this tournament, I think most people would say the two best teams so far have been probably Gen G and HLE. Then you look at the tournament, you say, wow, it sucks. HLE had to face Gen G, but they took a game off of them. Was it kind of a fraudulent win by HLE? Sure. Did they get absolutely stomped in the early game, even if the game they won? Yes. Did it take a miracle engage by Delight and Zeka to turn that game around when they were about to lose Dragon Soul? Yes. Did they get stomped the next two games? They sure did. Um, did they drop a game to FlyQuest? They did. But uh, FlyQuest did some unexpected things, uh, obviously in that series and the game they lost was the new new game which was actually i think very well played and also not really sure what hanwa was doing that game and i don't know if they know what new new does as a champion after watching it but we get to that point and uh hanwa still cleans up fly quest in the third and final game of the series it's pretty convincing and they end up just punching their ticket straight to the quarterfinals. So I, I still think Hanwell Life probably is the favorite to get out of this bracket. I would not have said they were the favorite against BLG coming into this event, but with BLG's current form compared to Hanwa, I don't see how you could argue for BLG, really. That's why they're going to have to level up. It's going to be interesting. <laughs> Meanwhile, I actually think if you go and look at the bottom one, this is actually super interesting because if you think about it, right, Top Esports, one of the only teams that has beaten them every time this year pretty much is T1, it feels like. That's the one that's the bummer, isn't it? Except for in the, the BO1 of the Swiss when they played them in all those series, MSI, uh, this one, uh, 
No, what, did they play them at MSG? No, they didn't. They didn't get MSG. AEWC in the final. That was the one where they only looked good on game one, then they just collapsed completely. So maybe T1 has the chance to make top four. But the problem is, I do think TS is still a sleeper. Like, they look really good. FlyQuest at least got punished. They at least just did get the number one team that should give them zero chance to win a best of five. Like, <laughs> just over. Literally any other team. If you could have any other team, you'd have, like, even a tiny chance. I think you've actually got the team where you've got zero chance. There's actually, like, a zero percent chance to win. I mean, they deserved it based on the way yeah, that they qualified for this bracket. Like, this is, they would have been, in, in a sane world, FlyQuest would have been probably the lowest qualifying seed if we had seeded this tournament properly, even though they were one in NA. Let's just say one in NA is typically less than three or four in LPL and LCK. And so, therefore, they should have been placed against the number one seed of this tournament, which would have been Gen G, obviously, as reigning MSI champions. Um Maybe because they got second place at, at domestically, you would put BLG higher. Uh, but regardless, drawing one of those teams should have been the, the result if we were preceding this event. So I'm happy with this. It could give us, you know, a three LCK team semifinal, which would, you know, the rematch between Gen G and T1, if T1 can actually make it that far. Obviously, they look worse than they did at. EWC and earlier this year so I wouldn't necessarily count out top esports like top I think has been good um even if they haven't had the the most difficult road in the last couple of games like they started out against T1 whom they beat obviously earlier at this event uh and then they played Gen G uh and lost that game so there is a chance for them to come back uh, if we go back to, I mean, if we want to talk about that matchup, though, if we go back to the start and we look at the way that the T1 versus Top Esports game went, that was a game where Tian was absolutely popping off. Um, it was, I mean, Tian probably has been the best jungler of this event so far. Even if other members... His dream of is to be a, a two-time World's MVP and two-time World's Daddy Award winner. <laughs> then he has to He's on his way. catalog. Yeah, no one can ever defeat that one. You know, that's like better than Faker in many ways, you know. The Jameis Winston of uh, of League exactly. of Legends. Yeah. <laughs> Must, he'll, throw, he'll throw tons of touchdowns, but they come with giant interceptions and you just have to deal with that. Um, but Tian, Tian, I think, has been probably the best player in his role. Uh, and we've we've also seen just increasingly, you know, good performances, I think, by top esports. Cream looks much more comfortable at Worlds than he than he did at uh, MSI, obviously, now that he has a little bit more a few more international games under his belt. Three, six, nine, I guess, has probably been a little bit shaky. Um, but for the most part, like, I think if you're a top esports fan, you're pretty happy with how things are going for you. The problem is, like, no one expects anything of Weibo, really. They probably will just lose to LNG. The big series that can change everything is just the BLG series. If BLG actually is way better in best of fives, then it'll be an exciting bracket. If not, then Hanwha and LNG have a very interesting semifinal to play. Well, I, I'd remind actually, people... I better on those two. I'd it's remind people that a lot of the... A lot of B BLG's troubles were actually in the best of threes where they would lose those game ones domestically. It wasn't like they were clean sweeping people uh, in the summer split, especially in the regular season. So I think BLG is pretty adaptable over a multi-game series. And oftentimes BLG's biggest wins, their statement wins, are the final games of those series. Like they close a lot stronger than they open. So I would anticipate BLG to perform better in best of fives based on what we've seen from this team in the last split. So hopefully we can get some of that uh, because the, By best the, way, of, the best of ones were obviously what, unkind to them. What do you think about them pulling the LCK move, but this time it's an LPL team where you just go, oh, did we just play the whole split with this jungler, win the championship with him, get all the way. You know what? Fuck it, you're out. Just bring the old guy back in. It's like, what do I do? Nothing. Get him back in. Suit up, soldier. You ship it out in the morning. Like, what is, what is this movement? No, no Western team would ever do this, bro. What do you think of this move? So, I do <laughs> okay. think that Wei was not having a good tournament. Um, I do think that he was getting outclassed. But, would you say that he was the number one problem on this roster no the answer would be oh, on no. like clearly it would be on but you have no substitute for on so therefore you have to sub even 
if, if you think that Wei is your second worst player, but you actually have a positional substitute in Jun for him, then I guess Jun is going to be the one coming in. And yeah, to Jun's she, credit, she, he's done well. She, she means they're on the sidelines, right? Fucking Wei is sat there. He's, go, he's talking to the coach. Like, ah, we're just losing all the games. So it's wrong, aren't they? He goes, yeah, you're right there. And he goes, oh, you know what our biggest problem is? He goes, not me. He goes, no, I agree with you. And he goes, ah, we're never going to win if it stays at S. The coach goes, nah, something has to be done. So anyway, you're out. Jun's back in like, what? Because <laughs> you are right, Monty. Just just by inference of who they have as a sub, they just can only replace him. So even though it's not him playing badly, <laughs> it basically on got him benched. Thanks. <laughs> if only, yeah, exactly. If only we had some depth for on. Ah, we don't. What are we gonna do, Coach? Bench you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Get the fuck out. Get the fuck out. Uh, that said, though, I think I think Jun has has actually made a difference in this roster. And sometimes you just need to make a change to freshen things up within the team and actually give some hope. Uh, so I haven't been upset with the way things have been going with Jun in particular. Um, and I, I think that if that's, if they feel they needed his voice on the team or it's not even really his champion pool uh, because he's, he's playing a lot of, I don't know, Skarner, right. Which is what everybody's playing. It has become like a top pick. You would think that way would you be just as proficient on this champion. We're not seeing like, oh, here comes Jun's kindred, right? Or here comes Jun's Nidalee. Uh, the champions that we would associate as pocket specialties of his. And so I don't think that's been the main factor. I think it's just been that Wei wasn't performing up to the standards of BLG. And even though On has been performing worse there was at least some way they could mix up the roster and perhaps meaningfully improve by making that swap. Now, has it made them instantly better? Maybe a little bit, uh, but they also had very tough opponents to start things out. And BLG's run ended with easier opponents. So because of the difference in the strength of schedule, it's a little bit hard to tell. And also they haven't exactly, I would say had the cleanest macro a lot of the time. Um, and G2 very nearly won this series, right? I think it was By the hard. way, G2 also, considering they started with pain, got a fucking brutal run of teams, bro. Like oh, they yeah. Were in the end. They got I mean, four G playoff teams. G2's road was Hanwha, who they lost to, but they almost came back versus. Um, Hanwha did throw. Keep that in mind. G2 beat Weibo, so they actually beat a team that made it to quarterfinals. They hit T1 and then they hit BLG. Like obviously BLG was going to be the worst possible draw for them. And as I said, at the start of the show, I think it was possible for them to beat any of these other teams in the two, two stage. So it really does feel like a bummer because almost certainly the teams that should have gone through in this stage were BLG and G2. And then whoever the fuck else, depending on that third matchup. Uh, but we didn't actually see that happen because they played each other. Uh, and G2, it, it sucks, man, because I think that they were doing well. Did I like the rise composition? I think they picked a very low range composition into an Ezreal, which made it very, very difficult for them to ever kill Elk in this game. So I wasn't too big of a fan of some of the solutions that they had found. Um, but I liked a lot of their picks over the course of the tournament. Like I thought it was very cool that we, I mean, the Broken Blade had a very good Galio yeah, game, awesome. right? Yeah. Um, his they, they got to pull out the old Broken Blade Yasuo, which has been that, that NAR legit. counter pick, yeah. right? That That's worked good. out very well for them. They had really good setup. Mickey X kind of entered the first game that they played against BLG, but then he came, he bounced back with a really good Rakan game. Uh, I like seeing the surprise picks like the Tarek. I think that the Silas is very dangerous uh, when you pick that Tarek because he can go ahead and steal that Tarek ult. Uh, and it was a good pick for Knight. But even so, G2 spent a lot of that game pretty far ahead due to some nice realm warps and, like, power plays by caps. So it was really close. If G2, despite, I think, their weaknesses in terms of range, if they hadn't gone for that early Baron and given it up, and apparently what happened, Thorin, was that they thought Bin's Rumble didn't have TP, uh, which he absolutely did. And he had ha actually had his TP up for three minutes, but I think they thought he TP'd into the Drake fight that happened right before that right. Baron. Uh, but he didn't, he just walked there. 
And so when Ben TPs onto that bear, it makes a lot more sense. Now, is it inexcusable that a professional team doesn't know that this guy's TP has been up for three fucking minutes? Yes, that is a very bad mistake, right? You have to track that TP. It's critical game information. It got lost in the shuffle somehow, that info. So they do the Baron. Ben shows up with TP, and they find themselves kind of overcommitted without a lot of their ults up that they used to win the previous Drake fight. That really sucks for G2. Uh, I think in that situation, you just have to burn the Baron, but they tried to turn off of it and basically got cooked. But if they get that, you know, th then they're able to split push, and then they're able to maybe able to win the game. The problem is, Thorne, is that the risk we have to do the risk versus reward calculation like g2's winning right and the problem is if they give up that baron their composition is three melees a rise and a callista they have no way to walk up on a wave to clear it with this composition which means that if you give the enemy baron you lose all your turrets that's it like the, the game is over um so even though they lose baron and the gold is still close the Baron buff being on BLG when they have this Ezreal, when they can zone you off the turret with Rumble and Skarner, and you cannot walk Rise up on that wave to clear it, means that it, the game becomes extraordinarily difficult to win, in my opinion. So you just can't take that risk, right? If you are G2, and it was really their own, I would say, uh, eagerness. They seem nervous, right? That they might actually win this game. It was their own eagerness that I think caused them to have problems because BLG was looking beatable. I also think, by the way, if you notice in this tournament, thankfully it was only that one game where they like forced Knight onto some shit I thought wasn't that good. And generally I've let him have his picks now. Like he now he can play all the fucking picks you like want to see him on. Silas, Nico, LeBlanc. These are the picks. Ari, these are the picks where he's actually going to do work. He's actually had a fairly good world. He wasn't the main reason their team had issues. The only thing I've noticed in their games is him and Ben have played well individually, but the macro for this team has been really fucking sus though, mate. Like some of the decisions they make late game are criminal. Like, I actually yep. do think they're sort of lucky they didn't play a bigger name in these last games. They could have got knocked out for sure. That's why it's, the whole thing is, like, how, how do they level up now in the next few days? I mean, you could argue, by the way, that does mean BLG can now practice Gen G, T1, the people on the other side of the bracket. That'll be interesting. Well, you know, it's also weird here. because we're not used to having this team have terrible macro, right, to making these decisions about when to fight that may be suboptimal. Um, and... Sure, I do think that they, when Jun was playing on this roster a lot in spring, it was a pretty rote formula of, like, pick winning bot lane, send Jun bot lane, you know, gank or invade jungle with pressure, then Elk and Honor also in your jungle, and they're killing your jungler, and then they're taking control of the game and fast-pushing your turrets. Like, it was a pretty simple formula. And BLG did struggle in lane swaps at MSI. Like, that was part of the narrative of that event, for sure. And one of the reasons why they were not able to complete a run to take out Gen G at that event. But, you know, they did look better, at least at the start here, in terms of their lane swapping abilities. And way you would think would have been they had a more diverse style in summer when it came to how they played the map and so it is curious that they would kind of go back now jun hasn't been like hard forcing bot per se but they they and maybe he can kind of lead this team into a better macro but we haven't seen that yet even with the the games the two best of threes we saw since they switched junglers so there's not really a reason to believe that that would be the case Question is, what do you actually think? Is there even a world like it? Do you even think if they do like some ridiculous whip or pick top lane that they can win a game off Gen G? Is it is it possible? <laughs> or some inspired fucking Ivan <laughs> fucked up LS comp Exordia <laughs> shit? Is there is there a way we can get a game? Can we get a game here? For, for Look, quest? Gen G likes to happy game, and sometimes what I will say about Gen G is they are very reminiscent of Samsung White from 2014 in that they don't always take their opponents the most seriously if they're very confident that they can beat them. We've seen this in the... We saw it versus KT in the regular split. We saw this versus Top Esports at Esports World Cup where they picked some... They just wanted to play Karthus even though it really wasn't in the meta at that point in time. They've had bad meta reads at the start of events. I think the problem is for... for 
FlyQuest is that Gen G has been actually one of the meta leaders at this event, which is different to other times that we've seen them. I mean, if you actually look at the way that they played against Hanwha in the first phase of Swiss, they were the ones who were busting out, like prioritizing the Aurora, playing the Nocturne, right? More than anybody else. Kenyon had three Nocturne games. They wanted to play Nocturne Callista, right? Because Pays is a great play. Callista, helps you win lane, helps you control the bot side. The problem with Callista is how do you do damage in the mid and late game? Well, it turns out you can auto attack if you have Nocturnal to cover for you and, and make up for your shortcomings in terms of short range. And you can box people up with an Aurora ult, right? And so Gen G, in many ways, I think, was the one who really started prioritizing the Nocturne pick, which is now kind of filtered out to the rest of the teams. We're seeing more Callista usage as well. Aurora priority, I think, is shot up as a result of Genji really just wanting to pick this champion. Um, and they've shown us weird meta picks like the Twitch that work really well. So it feels like the versatility is there for them. The big problem, you have to say for FlyQuest, and maybe this is a symptom of playing against Team Liquid, but how are we doing these drafts where... Yone and Aurora and Rumble fall all the way through these drafts, right? Like I have to say, every time someone competent has picked the Aurora, it looks really fucking good. It looks really good. Bro. Not impact, though. We'll get to that. Uh, sure. <laughs> it is very strong. Um, and especially because we're in a, a, a meta that has a lot of AoE damage. So being able to you know, use Aurora ult and get get everybody bottled up for that is very effective. Um, it also is a, you know, a lane bully that can really take control over a lane and therefore help you take control over the map. So I think the Aurora usage is justified, but FlyQuest doesn't want to prioritize this champion. Now they ended up taking it in the final game of this series, but is Whippo's plan just to play like Cassante, Renekton, and Galio into Keen? That that's not enough, right? Or are we going to get the Darius back without TP? Like that's not going to throw Gen G for a loop. You know who is? You know who also plays weird Darius picks? Oh, it's Keen. Keen's the guy in Korea who does that. You know, he's like Whippo, but he has a bigger champion pool and also doesn't just randomly int in lane and put his team behind and then when he's behind, continue inting until you lose the game. Uh, Keen is a much more stable, more weak side player, but he has the versatility in the champion pool. So where is the advantage going to come from? Like FlyQuest is not prepared for this meta. And the reason why they were able to take out Team Liquid is that Team Liquid is somehow even less prepared for this meta. Uh, so I, I'm not seeing it because how are we going to take these guys out? Right? Are, are, you, are we running back the new new? I don't think Canyon's going to be confused by this, even though I don't think Canyon has had a particularly stunning tournament by any means. Um, but there's so many weapons on the side of, of Gen G that it feels very unlikely that even in some happy gaming situation, that Gen G will lose a map here. They're just too good right now. No, so. I think they have no chance whatsoever. I think it's actually going to be a hilarious 3 0 clap. <laughs> All right, Fly FlyQuest has had an interesting run, and we can switch the conversation. Oh, by the way, that reminds me, though, there's one thing right. I have to bring up. Though. Did you not see that headline? I think it was by Nuke Duck, where the quote was something like that what FlyQuest was doing at Worlds was they weren't scrimming against top teams like Gen G and stuff because they were like keeping all their peaks, picks and meta secret. Like, yeah, we won't share what we've got. So, like, I, I, someone confirm in chat, I'm pretty sure that that is what the headline was. It was something like, you know, we're just not screwing up so that people don't know what we're working with. It's just, just like, one, that's hilarious because you're now playing the best team in the tournament. You probably wish you'd probably played all team one and all that, you know, and got like up to date with the meta. And then two, what what even is that? Like, there's no, it's not season two. You haven't like cracked the meta and got some <laughs> secret shit. That's like some, like singing Lord of the Rings. I rewatched it the other day when it's that, you know, that scene they made the meme of where he goes, all right then, keep your secrets. Like, what even is that? What even is that? There's nothing. There's no well, flag tech secret fly quest secret tech there's not well, well it's also like the reason why they're doing that is because when the when the picks come out it is true that korean and chinese teams will like share their pit those they'll be like hey guys did you know that fly quest is doing blah 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 right and they do share those picks with each other like it is known that teams do that at worlds but at the same time thorin what 
what what is the upside here? My question for FlyQuest is this. You have a rookie AD carry, and you have a second-year support player. You are not going to win Worlds by having some fucking secret pick. You barely, barely made it to quarterfinals because you got the biggest lucker draw of all time through the Swiss phase. You haven't beaten anybody. Your, 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 your masterful picks, sure, I mean, maybe they, maybe that Nunu was the main reason you actually won a, get, a game against Hanwha, but you don't close the series. So basically what you're saying is the one of the only times in a year that you have the opportunity to scrim Asian teams and get your young players better, you're just not going to do it. Just You're just not going to do it. And instead, we're just going to use all of that time that we could have spent getting better to play Nunu against let me let me look uh fanatic right in scrims like what the fuck is that did we learn anything from this event if we're fly quest this is what you do when you're g2 guy if g2 was doing this no problem they're super veterans with this roster right maybe because of g2's history of having these special picks and actually winning winning against good teams with them you could do that but it, to me it seems like such a wasted opportunity on behalf of FlyQuest, and any analysis that you guys are going to say, well, it got them to quarterfinals. No, the shit Swiss system got them to quarterfinals. They beat GAM and PSG and Team Liquid. That's that's who they beat to get to quarterfinals. They lucked their way into quarterfinals. And are you telling me that by scrimming against only NA and EU teams that they got this result? Because if you're telling me that by not scrimming against Asian teams, they wouldn't have made quarterfinals with the opponents that they managed to have, what the fuck is wrong with you? What the fuck is wrong with you? They would be better. They, the they would just objectively be better if they had been scrimming the Asian teams. See, you've made the same mistake everyone else has. You're still just trying to play the game of chasing after the Koreans. If you do that, you'll always oh, be in their yeah. way. And you'll never be as good. What you need to do is this. Papa Smithy is a thinker. He understood what I referenced earlier, which is you took that facetiously, that the best way to make it out of Swiss system into playoffs is by getting incredibly lucky. No, 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 Monty. That is literally the best way to do it so what papa smithy did is a bit like one of my like sleeper picks for a foreign language film a lot of people haven't seen that's quite interesting it's a film called intacto where it's about the idea that there's people out there who were incredibly lucky so for example they hunt down this guy who like survived a plane crash where he's the only one who survived in his chair and then everyone else was like killed instantly in the plane crash so they find people so what papa smithy did was this monty he decided i don't need to get like the next great coach people have tried three but he can't get through to the players somehow there's always that disconnect with blabber you can bring in the the Koreans, you can bring in Sasong, bring him in, he's nothing in NA, take him back to LCK, he's winning worlds, fucking LCK, triple, so it doesn't work, what you gotta do instead is find someone to channel luck, like X-Men, that's their X-Men power, they're one of the most powerful, so what they did is, they understood, Papa Smith he also understands an alchemical concept which is about inversion, you have to find the opposite of something, that has a, a correspondence, so what Papa Smith he did was, he went to the one man who knows about being the most unlucky at worlds, DeMonte because when DeMonte <laughs> went to Worlds, he in Clutch Gaming was the first one to go 0-6 at Worlds. He went 0-6. He got a super hard group. Everyone was better than him. It was like RNG, T1 for now. He got 0-6. And what he said was that he actually understood a very key spiritual concept, Monty, which is who knows more about sin than a sinner? So he found the most unlucky man ever, DeMonte. But DeMonte understood that if what he'd done in life led him to the scenario where he was the most unlucky player, he would turn it around and he'd do everything the opposite. He <laughs> became a coach he knew he didn't have the hands for the game he'd start actually studying the game instead of just going like hey pro vibes and shit let's go to the gym later which used to be one tactic to have final success your camaraderie but then he understood you had to nerd out on the game and eventually he joined a team called CLG you might think well how unlucky is that you're never going to go anywhere CLG no because CLG reverse bought themselves into a better team and he won LCK he won LCS I mean suddenly he never won LCS as a player he's won LCS or this guy's so fucking lucky he goes to Worlds that team what 
happens? They don't draw a single Asian team when they need to. They get into top eight. He then goes, you know what? I'm not really getting the big box here. I'm just a side coach. Papa Smithy goes, I found my man. He brings him in. DeMonte brings his lock. And what happens? <laughs> Fly quest. Bullshits. Literally, the game wins LCS for them. They don't, you know, he used to have to try and play the game really well and win LCS. Now the game wins LCS for DeMonte. He's won another championship. Then he goes to Worlds. Another insane draw because you've got the power of DeMonte. Do you understand that? This isn't just a normal draw. He is he is he is forcing the hand of chance. He is bending the universe to his mind like Dark City at the end. And that's how FlyQuest built the blueprint to go into World Stop It. You get DeMonte, he's now the luckiest man in NA, and it's all working out for him. More, more more like, the end of my presentation, end of my TED talk. More like DeMonte, if, if that's if that's the case. And in many ways, Monty, it is absolutely tanner time now, Hobie. Exactly. <laughs> It's Once finally time, Tanner time. Once it, upon a dude, time, that was a reasonable have, statement. Have, now it is absolutely have applicable. You, have you considered, have you considered, Thorin, that it is now both Tanner time and the year of the duck at the same time? There you go. <laughs> turns out all you needed was to plant some memes 10 years ago. They've all come to blossom The year now. of the duck exactly. and Tanner time are now happening simultaneously. Exactly. Um, Two combined. <laughs> who could possibly defeat that force? Exactly. <laughs> Uh, to to be fair, guys, I do think that probably the FlyQuest scrim thing was overstated. I don't think that they scrimmed zero Asian teams. Like, I don't think they did that. They probably just played some more standard picks uh, when that was occurring and saved their, like, secret stuff for the for either scrims against NA or scrims against EU um, so that it wouldn't have a less likely chance to, to leak out there. Uh, also, uh, w uh, one thing that I think is funny about this FlyQuest roster is that when you include the coaching staff, Thorin, technically most of this roster is just actually not North American at all, right? You have Nuke okay. Duck and Mithy alongside Bwipo Inspired and Quad. So it's really only Masu and Busio and Tanner because Arrow is also the the ADC coach on this roster. So they have actually somehow managed to punch through a team with a vast minority of not even only North American players, but North American coaches as well. So is this even really a, a great success for North America? <laughs> what, what one might say? No. Uh, one thing that. that I thought was interesting was that, um, so Cajol was broadcasting from the studio from the LEC studio, uh, and Papa Smithy like popped on his stream afterwards to talk to him about the stuff and brought up a very good point, which is that in that match versus Team Liquid, which we can talk about shortly, when Kled came out uh, within this draft, one thing that happened during the pick and ban was that Nuke Duck, who is on comms, right? It's Nuke Duck and Mithy, who are the coaches that are on stage with them. Because Nuke Duck has experience with Finn, was actually able to like yeah. download Kled into his team's mind because he's actually one of the players who has the most experience oh, <laughs> dealing with Kled. It makes, it makes sense. Yeah. It makes sense, right? So if you were if there was a team that you were not gonna do Kled against, it probably should have been the Nuke Duck team. <laughs> because, you know, we didn't see a lot of Kled in North America, but it it always has been a pick across Finn's teams uh, when Finn has played. So Europe would just, and Nuke Duck would be much more familiar with working with that pick. So I thought that was a, an interesting nugget about that series uh, and about the Kled pick in particular, which I'm not sure what it was supposed to do, actually. Uh, I'm very curious about the, the Kled pick and what they thought the result of picking that champion would be because it is uh, it was it was quite bizarre. It was quite bizarre. Worst thing is, you just know they're even going to do it. Where, like, at least last year, NRG could do the one of like, well, we did to be fair beat like G two. They didn't even do that this time. Like, West they beat nobody. <laughs> they just beat. The joke is, you just have to play yourselves in fucking wildcard regions. What even is that? That's nothing, mate. That's an out. Well, guys, I think this is a good opportunity before we talk about Team Liquid. To, and FlyQuest and that matchup and how it went down, because you're all very eager to hear about the Kled, is that if you would like to join FlyQuest, you may want to use our sponsor, Babbel, because learning other languages may be very useful when you're playing with a bunch of Europeans on this roster. And Babbel, of course, is an app on your phone. Each of those lessons that you get are like quick 10-minute lessons, but they're 
crafted by over 200 language experts, and it's very practical. They introduce terminology. They get you to use it via speech recognition, so you're actually talking using those words in the with the language by talking into your phone. You're then using them in reading and text message conversations, so it's a very like practical way to learn how to use the language, not a bunch of classroom BS that you're never going to use or conjugating verbs Brotely, and then trying to figure out how you're actually going to use that in some sort of conversation in the future. They've sold six over 16 million subscriptions. They have 14 different languages for you to check out, and they're backed by a 20-day money-back guarantee. So there's not even a risk if you guys don't like it. So if you are planning to try and learn another language, it's a really easy way to kind of get through it every day, uh, feel like you're actually progressing in that language. We have a special upcoming holiday deal for you guys. You can get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription at babbel.com slash summoning, up to 60% off babbel.com slash summoning, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash summoning. Rules and restrictions may apply. So, you know, get ahead of your New Year's resolution to, like, do something. Or maybe you're going on a vacation for the holidays. Need to learn a language. Just a little bit. Get yourself by. Here you go. Babel. Courtesy of us. Thank you, guys. By the way, one, shout out people actually do use that. And two, one thing I actually like about using apps to learn languages too is I actually find it really useful that they send you all those push notifications to remind you and if you haven't done it for the day and stuff. Otherwise, I would forget loads. Of, like the amount of times I get sure. all those and I'm like, well, I thought I already did it today. And I'm like, well, obviously I wouldn't get the notification I'm thinking of yesterday because anything you do do every day, it's very easy in your brain to sort of like displace that memory a little bit, you know, and like you're not sure exactly famous thing like if you unload the dishwasher or lock the door because in your brain, you can just remember doing it a million times. So I actually even find the way these apps are set up very useful in that sense. Like they're good for keeping you reminded to do it, like the rough routine of how you're doing it. And it's yeah. easy. You just do like a minute or two a day. It's not very long. Yep. All right. It's just the daily routine that will get it in there for you guys. So take a look. You guys have been trying to learn another language. Babbel offers you a great way to do that. There's so also loads talk... of languages on there, right? Oh, loads. yeah. Like everything you want, Italian, Spanish, French, all that shit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so FlyQuest versus Team Liquid, Thorin. Team Liquid. Comes into worlds with expectations. Sure, they lost that final supply quest. That was a fluke, though. We are here. We have the world class macro. We were taking it to T1 earlier this year. And now this is going to be the shining moment TL in quarterfinals. They even get the cupcake draw of the rematch against FlyQuest, an opponent they know all too well. And yet, they can't play Yonai and they can't play Aurora. And Impact is having a questionable tournament after being the MVP of the LCS. APA? Patch Zerg? Confirmed? We just got to say it at this point in time, guys. People were hyped. I want to get into this about APA. People were hyped about APA because it didn't appear like he was a Patch Zerg because he just kept getting, he kept going on and on and on. And I think, guys, it was a crazy confluence where he was ahead of the meta with his patch zerg champions he was playing really in soul before many other people he was playing zigs before many other people and they were as it turns out very overpowered at this point in time when he was playing them and as these champions got nerfed as he had to dig deeper and deep and the talia as well as he's had by the, the way think how insane that is monty already he only had a few champions then out of nowhere a talia meta comes back into league of legends like yeah it was just like one after another him, right slapped him up the head with it, the it was like meta. it was like it's a really crazy, insult and sure yeah. his ari has been okay like he his tristana sure, he has been games. okay at times so he's had some more meta picks but when it comes to Playing at serious international competitions, APA is getting slapped up by the head, upside the head by fucking quad, guys. Quad. Need need I remind you that quad was on Nongshim Red Force and DRX. Quad is actually a relatively experienced player. He has played some splits and some games within the LCK. But he wasn't good enough to stick in the LCK, to stick around. He comes in to FlyQuest Challenger roster, beats up NA Academy teams, gets promoted, and then shits all over APA. Okay? Now, Quad has had a much more versatile and meta-proof champion pool. APA is playing Syndra 
very badly at this event. Flashing in when they have range advantages with their champions, losing games, playing the Nico, not being able to get the flanks off and execute Rocket Belt flank, flank engages in very winnable fights. Okay? And the question comes down to is APA actually good enough for this team? Because if we can't play Aurora and we can't play Yone, and we've known these champions have been OP for months, guys, Yone has been OP for months. Why can't we play Yone if we're Team Liquid? Why can't Impact play it? And, and, can't... Well, and as you said earlier, what the fuck was the idea of that clip? <laughs> Yone's will be the white flag at the end. It's just over it now. <laughs> I, look, I'm not going to pretend that I know. It's all right, go the, we've, the, already, the... We've, already, we've already given them Yone and Skarner. Let's stay clad. <laughs> I'm out. I'm just out. I, I'm going to say it right now, Thorne. I don't know about the Yone versus Kled matchup. Maybe that is supposed to be a good matchup for Kled. Yeah. I don't know. But what I do know, Thorin, is that when you fall behind on Kled, you are fucking useless. That is what I know. And so a pick that snowballs that hard, if you are going to lose that skirmish in the mid lane, and then not only that, but you are going to try and fight a grub fight where you have two ults. You have Kled ult and you have Rumble ult, and Rumble ult is on cooldown, and the rest of your team, your jungler, ADC, and supporter level 5, why the fuck are we fighting at Grubs? You literally don't have Rumble ult, the only ult that is relevant in that situation, and they just all in the on Grubs and lose the game. And this is the macro team, so it is not allowed, if you are Team Liquid, to both not be able to play meta mid lane champions, and even the fringe meta ones like Syndra that we've seen, not play them well, die in the in the back line a lot of the time, get picked off, be out of position, flash forward when you shouldn't. And then when we actually play, we have the pocket pick. It's like when we give them the meta picks, we pick fucking Kled. Like, th this is not allowed. How has this team, like, how can we continue forward with APA as a player, is my question. Wh how many more chances does this guy need to get? We were wowed by him being a specialist on certain champions that he is legitimately good at. But is this a long-term answer when Quad, a player who couldn't cut it in the LCK, comes in and fucking bops this guy? Surely we can do better. And not only that, Thorin, they have an import slot. So there's not even a reason. There's not even a reason to keep this guy around. There's just not. Especially because if you if you look at their team, Monty, yes, look, certain some of his picks are like picks that can help with their style, but they could keep all their meta strengths and all their macro strength and just bring in a better mid laner. And surely immediately, wouldn't this team like immediately be like a threat to be like they'd be the best Western team, like almost immediately? Surely they'd be right there with G two. They could potentially actually do some uh, world. So you just put in a stronger mid laner. Yep. And and I am even not way, even if they even if they're getting George or something, just bring someone like that in, bring someone yes. good in. Maybe, maybe, look, I, I think one of the problems with Cloud9 is that they had a weak coaching staff around JoJo. I think it's clear that maybe Mithy isn't cut out to do the emotional like work of head coaching. He didn't have any help. He was the only coach on Cloud9. He didn't have a staff. He was doing it all. I think it's very hard to demand of Mithy that he deal with positional coaching and strategic coaching and you know, be the 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 leader of this team all and the emotional coach all at the same time. I think that is a very big job for somebody, especially one with so many strong personalities like that Cloud9 roster had, right? And so when Mithy has moved, I'm just point this out, has moved to coaching to a positional coach on FlyQuest with Busio, Busio played way better in summer playoffs and at Worlds. He's been so much better. And I think a lot of that is probably Busio's coaching or uh, Mithy's coaching. So I don't think Mithy's a bad coach. I think that Cloud9 gave him much too big of a job, and maybe he's just not that good at solving some of these player personality issues. But if you put JoJo with Spawn, I think that becomes very interesting very quickly. Um, and certainly JoJo, by the way, his contract has been removed from the contract database, so I think he's actually a free agent. His lawyers will probably fight that one. I don't think he will win. I don't think he's going to beat Cloud9 in some sort of, you know, legal proceeding where they can prove that he showed up to scrims 43 times late. Like, I think that he probably has a justifiable cause for dismissal in there that has been documented by cloud nine. Uh, and if that's the case and he becomes a free agent, 
I think Team Liquid would probably be pretty crazy not to try and get him. Um, not only that, because, again, it opens you up to another import slot. As far as Team Liquid is concerned, too, I just don't believe that APA is the soul of the macro that is happening on this team. No way. Like, I have to believe that's Core JJ because it's always been Core JJ. When Core JJ is in form, he is very good at making these macro calls. Probably some combination of Core JJ, Umti, and Impact. And even though Umti did not, by any stretch of the imagination, have a good Worlds run, he struggled mightily at this tournament. He still has been a jungler, and even for Team Liquid, in the past that has had strong early games and has had strong early pathing. That's what we saw in LCK. So I do believe he can probably get back to that form. There's a question about whether Umti needs to be replaced as well. Yun, on the other hand, he was like crazy 1v9ing in some of these situations. His team left him out to dry quite a few times, and he kind of had to scramble for himself. And I think Yun actually did have a pretty good performance. And he has, we have seen Yun develop into a player that can play all the necessary picks in the in the meta, as well as clean up fights and carry. So I'm less concerned about him. But I think like when you look at APA, you, you can't say this guy deserves a starting mid lane slot on a roster that would otherwise be contending for championships. He's just not good enough. No, He's his not. problem is he, he he for real has to go and play for like, Dignitas or something like that, you know, like he, yes. an LC, LC, LCS player, obviously, but he's just not going to be on the best team. Come on. It can't be. Yeah. So um, there were more problems clearly on Team Liquid. You know, APA was one factor, but I think you can isolate at least his individual and mechanical performance here and say he's not world class. So if you have world class ambitions, there are probably better players you can do that with. And JoJo is definitely one of those players who has performed better mechanically internationally than APA has. So if By you the way, fix the problems with JoJo, then maybe this is a good spot for him. Obvious problem you did have is you got completely baited and switched by impact. Like he played like the best split of fucking his career in the ages and then played the absolute shit worlds. I think what that's, do do with that? I, I, I think there, there are several problems with team liquid. One is that they were very close to winning games because of their good macro in spite of bad laning phases and early deficits, okay? But they couldn't, it wasn't that they weren't didn't have the right idea. It was that their execution was bad and APA was a big part of that. I think another thing is Umti being like individually shit in terms of his decision making and when he was like, what objectives he was contesting, when he was going in on these objectives, how he was engaging fights, that was bad. But I, I think, as you say, Thorin, another factor here for Team Liquid is they play an entire split where Impact is carrying. He's having these strong performances. And when he starts to do badly, when he fucks up the lane swaps, when his jacks isn't looking good, you lose your identity as a team because you're used to kind of playing through him and having him pick up that slack. And now all of a sudden, there's tons of slack in this team, which is going to happen, right, by the way, like, Sometimes that one player is going to underperform. The problem with Team Liquid is when Impact doesn't perform, there isn't anyone to step up, right? APA isn't good enough to fill the void. So we just end up with this, right? We just end up with this mess. And it's, it's, it's why the fact that you say that there's an import slot is the key, most key part there. By the way, Monty, the thing you said about quad also is one of the reasons it's so irritating when people who don't watch LPL or LCK get really mad at those discussions. You know the ones, it's classically people like LS always bring them up of like, how would like G2 do in LCK? You know, if you ever point out that like even some of the top Western teams might lose to like the bottom teams in LCK, it's because people don't understand. Not all of those players suck. Some of those players, spoiler, are ah, delight. Fucking like we say, some of these people that now are in like top teams, like actually have yeah. skills, but they're just like at the moment they're in the wrong team or they're in a bad team or a team that doesn't function around how they play. And so you've seen this happen many, many times. It's not like the next Korean star really does come from challenger every time. Half the time they're just in the wrong team at the bottom of the league. And so it's not as much of a diss as people think when you're like, you harsh, you know, like, oh, this Western team wouldn't do that well in LCK. That as you say, by the way, think about just in the league itself, bro, Fear X was beating some of the top fucking teams and I wouldn't put them in 
Western world and expect them to do anything big. Like, I don't think people realize how talented some of those Koreans are. And as you've seen, by the way, the actual message of the LCS, despite what everyone told me last Worlds with NRG, is the opposite. It's to import, you idiots. Everyone's imported fucking ADCs and top laners and mids, and suddenly they're all better. It actually just works. Like, Thanatos <laughs> wasn't the reason he didn't go to fucking Worlds, was he? He's actually one of the few chances you had. I'd keep hold of him, mate. He looks good. Yeah, of course. Um, and like you obviously don't get rid of Impact or Core JJ because, you know, they've we've seen so much of Impact that we know that one bad tournament isn't a justification for kicking him because I think every team that ever has gotten rid of Impact has regretted it in the long run. He's yeah. too much of a key player within you know the 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 ecosystem of the LCS, uh, and he's too good. It's unfortunate they had a bad time, but also like Umti man, like what was going on with him this tournament? You know, I, I agree with flaming Umti, but I would like it if we flamed Umti for the right reasons. One of the most bizarre things that I saw this this world, Thorin, was in the interview. I mean, first off, Umti like shitting on Levi when, when, when Levi was retiring was kind of in bad taste, I would say, because Levi is a very he, that good was that player. Moment. That was that moment, Monty, where like the cultural clash occurs because he's like, oh, Americans love it when I'm talking shit. He's like, yeah, <laughs> like fuck him or whatever. And I was like, bro, he's retiring. Like, that's really bad <laughs> That was literally his really last game. <laughs> it's so like, and, and by the way, Levi was by far the best player on this game roster too. So it's not his fault. He's sure. around a bunch of bums. Umti, surely you of all people should sympathize with a player who's trapped uh, with a bunch of bums <laughs> surely um, you can understand that uh but anyway uh, one of the funny things was like after that interview they uh, during that interview they said hey um you only have like a 40 percent win rate on nocturne and he came back and he was like yeah but my career win rate rate is 40 percent because i was on breon you know what I mean? So first off, him having a 40%, he didn't say on the Breon part. I added that part. <laughs> but he did say, I have a career 40% win rate, which is just true. He's not going to be, he's not going to have a good win rate on most champions when his, he's been on bad teams, oh. right? And not only that, Thorin, but the thing that bugged me most about this was I was like, really? So I went back and looked it up. Before game two of GAM versus Team Liquid, Guess when his last professional Nocturne game was. The champion he has a 40% win rate on. Guess when it was. Is it going to be like four years ago or something? It was 2019. So we're bringing up a win rate of a champion he has literally not played in five years. As if it's relevant to him playing it right now. Was it even the same champion? Has it been reworked since then? No, it's the same champion. champion? But... Oh, okay, <laughs> that is a while ago, though. I know. Like, we just looked at a number, and we didn't actually check when the last time he played it was. And also, are we really shitting on his Nocturne when his best games of this tournament were all on Nocturne? Like, wh why are we at... Hey, hey, you know your 40% win rate Nocturne after he just goes and absolutely slaps Gam in two games in a row with the Nocturne. By far his best performances. So I, I don't really... So, some some of the research, let's just put it out there, that has been gone on at Worlds is lacking. <laughs> why, does, why does everyone hate Umpty so much? I never knew there was such vitriol against him. <laughs> he definitely fucked up with that cringe interview. And he's obviously not elite, but like, I think he's all right. Like, I, but it's with Monty. I think I have a similar take to you. I just assume he's like fucking Cordridge's minion and just does whatever he says. And so I think actually that's sort of part of why the macro angle works. I agree. I think you keep him in the team, despite what all the haters are saying. <laughs> I think you keep the jungle support you. It's probably the best thing about that team, isn't it? Sure. I think people are mad because he did almost cause them to lose the game. Um, he was bad for sure. His his Maokai game was horrendous. Like, actually the way, horrendous. In some ways, that also would have been fitting if Gamma had actually taken out 100 Thieves, Mad Lions, and Team Liquid. Then Dude, I, like was, point, I was rooting for at, it after bro, game at one. That point, at that point, we can't even talk shit to Gamma anymore. Like, they're better than the whole West, aren't they? Like, at that point in time, like, they're our kings. We have Dude, to get, I, we're trying to fight the final boss. We haven't even got through the beginning boss. Have you ever played Dark Souls? You can't go straight to the final boss, guys. I love this, Thorin, because how funny would it be if the Vietnam region that lost, like, half its players due to a gambling scandal who are paid almost nothing compared to oh. these stars of North America and Europe and Gam knocks out three of them in one event? That's crazy.
And also, Easy Love is the worst ADC at this tournament. And the they still involved. managed to do it. <laughs> best alias, though, didn't he? That's got a straight fire alias. By the way, in, infinite porn fucking partnerships anytime he wants them. And are you looking for Easy Love? Well, you know where you can find me. More for at bigdicks.com or whatever website you'd be going to. So I I don't know like it, there there were very big stumbling bot blocks for this gam team to overcome and they they nearly did it uh, they nearly did it um, it would have been very funny if they killed hundred thieves MDK and then actually team liquid uh, but they did take a game and honestly like had a better tournament than we would have anticipated given who they were coming in so they do play spoiler to the west in very weird ways. Uh, and they've kind of consistently done that now. This is a region that couldn't even play fucking internationally for two years during the pandemic. And they still By come the back way, and do this. If you actually notice, Monty, sadly, I, I can also confirm this as somebody who bet quite a lot. There was actually very few underdog wins in the Swiss, by the way. It was nearly always the favorite winning the series and the match almost all the time, basically. It was actually not a lot of big upsets. No. I mean, outside of the BLG games. Um, right. Because yeah. you would have you would have expected LNG and T, and uh, and T one to lose to BLG yeah. just based off of regional. BLG strength was the only one really that got upset, yeah, and they still made it through in the end anyway. So, yeah, and I I think yeah, it, it, again, it it happened this way because of G two and BLG at the end, but just purely based off of like seeding, like Weibo beating D plus right and FlyQuest beating TL, you would. If you if you think that the seeding and the regional strength is approximately the same, then th these would have been the the favored results for sure. I actually didn't think about that, but that's true. Because if you think about it, what really sucks is this: the two teams you were supposed to hope for from the West was G two and TL, not fucking FlyQuest. Nobody was hoping for FlyQuest. <laughs> Like I think could do anything. That's why it's perfect. They got Genji. All right. I mean, let's see I, them get absolutely dunked it, on at this point in time. If we're, but if we're maybe coming into the event, but if we're actually thinking about how they performed at Worlds, I think everybody would rather see FlyQuest. Like FlyQuest had some very entertaining games. The new new game was very interesting. Now, was playing Zyra and early picking it just completely terrible from Peanut and Hanwha Life? Sure. Their composition was ass, but they found a way to win with that new new, right? Inspired was all over the map with it. There were problems still with FlyQuest, like losing a Drake when you have a Callista and new new, which is 1000% illegal to do. There is no universe where anyone should be able to steal a Drake from you when you have Rend consume and smite that you can all use simultaneously that is not fucking allowed in professional league of legends it is actually egregious that it was possible to lose that but they have had unique picks they have had interesting takes on the meta quads like cassiopeia pocket may in theory be good into yone because of its grounding you can catch yone and get him grounded and he can't actually snap back and maybe you can kill him um, so I think they were experimenting with some interesting things, and I think at least they have a level of versatility. Now, do they have a lot of versatility? No. In their first game versus Team Liquid, they should have picked Braum and Busio's playing Lulu. Lulu's not bad. I think Braum's better in that composition. Um, <laughs> wasn't a Tom Kench, which is an absolutely outrageous pick for Team Liquid in that situation. Just completely terrible. What is it even supposed to do? Their FlyQuest is playing a comp where they want to kite you. What is Tom Kent supposed to do? Core JJ just buys a million armor, like iron elixirs. Why? Who knows? And then he also builds Heart Steel, doesn't auto people in team fights, and has two Heart Steel stacks at the end of that game. Just legendary shit buying from Core JJ in game number one of that it. series. Just legendary. <laughs> <He's my shopkeeper. laughs> it's not only that it's like he buys heart steel and he literally just stands around in combat trying to lick people instead of autoing them i i don't know what was going on just unwilling to prac to to proc heart steel um so yeah uh i i, I think like FlyQuest, despite the weakness of their opponents has also been Probably one of the more entertaining teams to watch. So I don't hate this. Plus, they're against Genji and they'll get clapped. So it's fine.
Here's the one angle. I will say it in a bunch of different worlds. Inspired actually has played Canyon quite a lot. He used to get drawn against them on every tournament. So no help. You'll still get clapped, but there's an angle. You've got familiarity. You believe you can do it. <laughs> I think Trovi is going to fucking destroy Quad so hard it's going to be insane. So I'm waiting. I'm waiting for that one. Just waiting. Welcome back to the LCK quad. <laughs> That's why, in some ways, it is like it's obviously the setup's perfect, isn't it? Like, if Faker actually makes it to the final, he has to beat top esports and then probably Gen G. If you could do that at that point in time, you probably deserve to be in the finals. That's not going to happen, is it? But if you're a fan, if obviously in their brains, Monty, it's possible because remember. Got Jackie Love, he's a choker. And they got oh, Chovy, he's a choker as well. But he chokers all the way, and then we'll be in the finals and winning other worlds. The goat, the goat. <laughs> well, Thorin, I'm glad you brought this up because you and other people might actually need to change their underwear after watching Chovy just absolutely destroy Quad in the upcoming quarterfinal matchup. And if you need a change of underwear, why not slip on some MeUndies? Right? Of course. They're great. They have something for absolutely every guy. Micromodal fabric, made out of beech trees, by the way, guys, so it is a natural fiber, is extremely breathable, extremely soft, extremely smooth, and they've got it in tons of different styles. They have 10 different styles for men's underwear, so whatever you like, they've got it, briefs, boxer briefs, whatever you want, 10 different styles, and they come in over 100 different colors and prints. So you get standard colors, just black. You can get crazy prints that they've got all over there that are a little bit more fun. But they also have a lounge collection with joggers, hoodies, onesies, and more. So it's not just underwear, but it is very comfortable. Natural fibers to swath your balls in that, of course, have been perfectly shaven as well, as we know from our other sponsors. Uh, but you can be your more most comfortable self this fall with MeUndies. Get 20% off your first order, plus free shipping at MeUndies.com slash summoning. That's MeUndies.com slash summoning for 20% off, plus free shipping. MeUndies. Comfort from the outside in. And thank you very much to them for sponsoring us, guys. Get your change. You will need these after Chovy's game. After Chovy <laughs> wins Worlds, you will need to change your underwear. Right. So put yeah. slip on the MeUndies afterwards, guys. Yeah. Shout out to anyone who supports us by buying them and gets that percentage off. Um, so yeah, this is it's been it's been an interesting end to this Swiss stage, Thorin. Um do you do you want to say any final words for the terribleness of D plus Kia? I am so relieved that they will no longer be torturing me by forcing me to watch their games. I mean, they did prove in the end that they just weren't actually that good a team. The real problem is, to me, even though they had that win over fucking T1 in the regional that got people hyped, that was the only actual like non-regular season thing they did all year. The saddest thing about this team was, if you go back now and watch that episode where we big up aiming, you're going to think like, what the hell? He wasn't that good. He was. He was actually <laughs> probably the MVP of the league. Unless you do what I do, the Chover one, best player's the MVP. It's it was, Aiming's the MVP of the summer. It's I mean, he played well at Worlds too. It wasn't yeah. his fault his team lost. No, no. But the thing is, from the playoffs on, the team was never as good when they were in the playoffs. Like, they didn't have the same upset potential. Also, that's another thing that was really sad about this team, Monty. It, funny enough, reminds me of last year's D+. The Asian teams I hate are the ones that have zero chance of beating the better Asian teams. That just sucks. Like, I'd actually rather someone had... Like, you know what? As much as I don't like FlyQuest, at least they have a level of variance to their game. They can sort of get lucky and get better than they should. D+, will never do that, bro. Like, they just play to a certain level and they can't go beyond it. And they actually just showed, like, this roster just doesn't work. You've got to break it up. Like, look, you keep lucid. He worked out fine. That's all good. Showmaker's good, obviously. Aiming's pretty good. Aside from that, though, just retool. <laughs> Bring in a couple of other players. This could I, I, look, man, the squad. they Need keep trying. It's the, it's the unending quest for them to get a shot caller. Is it time for Daddy Barrel to come home <laughs> to this roster? I mean, I hate Barrel, guys, but even I admit that Barrel would probably be an upgrade for this roster because at least they would go back to having some amount of shot calling. And Mohab's performance was was abysmal. I mean, I don't know if it was nerves or what was going on, oh, shit, but he, even in even in the last series, in game three against Weibo, he absolutely sent it in these games. Engaging, he would literally be there. They would steal a Drake, and he would engage 
one versus five into the team while the rest of his team was trying to retreat. And there was no objective to take. And you know what happened after that, Thorin? Weibo took Baron and then used it to win the game. So if we, this was after they stole the Drake. After they stole the Drake, he decides to engage, a completely unnecessary engage, which then loses them the game. Okay? Here's the problem. He never actually was good, Monty. He just wasn't Kellen. That was his only <laughs> job was to not be Kellen. Turns out there's more to life for than just not being Kellen. And, and you know what? Oh. He actually managed to win a game on Renata Glass where they all end in the early game and he missed. <laughs> they like miss all of their abilities, including a flash handshake that he tries to go for, which... By the way, if you want Kellen for one champion, that champion is Renata Glask, and it was just a painful reminder. As much as you don't like Kellen, it, it, D-Plus has never found the satisfactory answer to not no, having no. Kellen on this roster. True. It is absolutely crazy. But we, we tried Bible, terrible in lane. Shot calling couldn't make up for it. Now we got Moham, who admittedly did have some impressive rel games, but when it matters most in your absolute elimination game where he gets his best champion, he just griefs it. So no, if this guy has this level of I'm nerves, gonna say it. it can't be allowed. Ready? Okay. Is everyone ready? I'm, gonna say <laughs> I'm ready. This should have been Katie Rolster. <laughs> no! <laughs> I, I wanted Katie Rolster here. No! I wanted pure shit just doing crazy shit in the jungle. I wanted fucking all that shit. I was, I was up for that. I was up for the Katie Rolster. How dare you? That would have been. Nah, it would have been glorious. They'd have fucked around and beaten like top esports or something. They'd have, I know Katie Rolster. They'd be trash, but they'd, they'd fuck around and win against someone good. They'd probably also let like a Western beat him like G2 or something. But it would be funny. They're ups and downs is what I'm here. But G, D plus was just boring. Change the channels. Change the fucking channels. Oh, I even forgot, Thorin. In this series, I forgot about his uh, criminal Nautilus game where Moham misses a Nautilus hook to engage, cues into a wall, then flashes out and then misses another Nautilus hook into a wall and pulls himself in to die. <laughs> so he goes in with hook too early, by the way, realizes this, misses, hooks the wall, goes to the wall, flashes out. And then when his team is there on the re-engage, then misses his hook and hits the wall, the same spot on the wall again. Just magnificent play from this guy. Basically, bring <laughs> John back from Fnatic and put him in D+. Steve. Solve both people's problem there. Solved it. Does it solve the shot calling issues? Because is, isn't he just bringing Fnatic shot calling to D+, which is exactly the same, right? That's I think that's the issue. And also... People will flame Lucid, but Lucid actually did have some really Yo, clutch plays. Fine to me. Yeah, he's also he's also a rookie, guys, and he's a rookie on a team with no internal shot calling apparently, and so he's trying to make the plays himself. Did he make some boo boos in the first game? Yes, but also he's probably the reason they won because he goes on an epic flank and actually catches Light out alongside Showmaker, and they get a nice pincer and kill Light, and then are able to take control of that game off of the mid lane fight. So. There are reasons, I think, to like Lucid. Is there any reason to like Kingen anymore? Seriously. Not really. All right, Summer, but he, he never looked real. It was always full gold. I told everyone that. I was I was a hater on my, like, to tear list. I put him quite low because I was like, there's no way this holds, mate. There's just no way. I don't buy it. Because even on champions that are supposed to be his signature champs, he, like, the Gragas, now the Gragas game, again, as I said earlier, the Gragas doesn't synergize with this composition whatsoever, but he still played it badly. <laughs> He still plays it's just on an individual level was not up to form. I guess if you're looking for some sort of consolation about D plus is that they did read the Caitlin Lux game very well. I thought they missed, they messed up their execution, particularly the bot side on the first gank, but they were playing to prevent the fast push and disrupt it from Caitlin and Lux. And they did it multiple times and they targeted light and they clearly had good team fighting, good plans. Showmaker's a great LeBlanc player. They're really good at playing with him on the flank in some of these team fights and setting up for him in target selection. So there were things to like, especially in game one about D plus because they came back and they did it in a good way. I thought, but overall, this is not a team that, I need to see in the quarterfinals and for the most part just made many, many bad macro errors throughout this tournament and also had significant individual misplays, particularly in the top and support positions. So good riddance, I say. I didn't need to say any more of them. It's all good. <laughs> and Weibo, I hope we see them eliminated very quickly as well. Uh, Chris and Zhao, who have not been it, man. Crisp has, Chris has been caught out so many times. And breathe, breathe, 
was very good in the last couple of series sure. that he played, but also was kind of shaky at the start. And Zhao, who just he hasn't been in typical, you know, good international Zhao Hu form. So I don't think we really need a lot of a lot more games from this guy, too. Tragically, I just don't think Weibo has the strength to really make a very deep run throughout this, especially with LNG looking significantly better. So I think we, I mean, we get it. Go ahead. Some amazing semis. Yeah. I mean, if we get uh, BLG or HLE versus LNG, uh, it could be very exciting. Hopefully we get, I would say we get LNG versus a Chinese team just so we have some international crossover, right? Um, and maybe top on the other side versus Gen G. Although Gen G versus T1 will certainly draw the most fans. What did you think of this, by the way, Thorin? We got zero NA versus EU matches in Swiss. Zero. That is Which is I, it's, I, it actually doesn't happen very often if you notice know so far in these Swiss. We've only had it happen a couple. It's kind of weird, isn't it? You know how you could make it happen? If you had GSL groups instead of Swiss. And you just put the NA and EU teams in those groups. We could actually just guarantee ourselves almost uh, having those matchups. Um, Definitely does suck though. Like think about it. Like you wanted pretty much all of them this time. You wanted to see like G two against Team Liquid, FlyQuest against Fnatic. Yeah. These would be great games. It would be fun. I wanted the TL Fnatic rematch because that's been an ongoing storyline throughout this year that we just didn't get to see at Worlds. Like that felt pretty disappointing. Um, like. Probably Team Liquid has kept their win streak up, but in their current form, who the fuck knows? Uh, Problem you is, just, you could, we you got could have had a lot of matches, but the mighty teams, PSG Talon and Gamma Esports, said no, Monty. They, 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 <laughs> they, they just had to both beat MDK. Yeah. Again, it was really it was really MDK's fault. Another, another international tournament destroyed because Mad Lions attends it. <laughs> it's actually just insane, isn't it? Disrupting the matchups we want to see yet again. Right, what now? <laughs> any any teams you wanna you wanna discuss at length here? Did you like what you saw from G two now that they've exited this event? Because I think a big question is the problem with G two is this, Thorn. They are overwhelmingly responsible for not only Europe but all of the West's success against Asian sure. teams. Overwhelmingly over the last five six years of competition. Sure. And so, how do you fix this roster? Can you upgrade it? Is there a way that you could assemble Exodia here even more than they already have? Like, Caps is clearly the main player. I think Broken Blade has consistently done well over the past couple of years. Mickey X, we didn't have great expectations for him this year, but he was on fire last year. Do you reasonably replace him? Because the thing about Mickey is, like, when he's good, he is utterly dominant and one of the best support players in the world. And when he's shaky, he's like Hillisang, right? Um, he didn't have a good tournament. Uh, even in the series against BLG, like he went from having a terrible rel game into a very good recon game. Um, there's just incredible variance with this guy. Uh, and so, like, Yike is Yike really the best? I think Yike makes some pretty questionable early game decisions and so ganking too. decisions at times. So, do you t do you think about replacing Yike on this roster with somebody who might be a little bit more of a, I would say, cleverer pathing jungler? In the inspired, early game? Inspired, 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 <laughs> inspired. I mean, inspired likes to play dead. his own game and he's never leaving an A, so I don't I just don't think that's gonna happen. But uh and then Han Sama, like, is there a player who would be conceivably an upgrade? Is Karzi a better choice for this roster? Um you know, do you do you bring in like a Karzi Lebrov? into the bot side at this point in time if Mickey is is not cutting it anymore. The problem is is that Mickey is the best support player in Europe when he's on. So can you what it, you have to know internally what are the factors that get Mickey to perform at the top level and can you replicate those factors? That's the question. He also me. has shown year on year he has been able to get back to the top level when he's had those like brief yes, exactly. times when he was so I think it's harder to divest from him. The problem is, yes, even though he's had by the way, there's nothing yikes done wrong. He's had a fabulous career so far. The problem is though, if you're asking, can I upgrade anywhere? Yeah, probably jungle. Like if I could get inspired or Razork, wouldn't that be the player? Wouldn't that potentially put me over the top? Uh, the Broken Blade one's an interesting one because to be fair, Topland's quite weak in Europe at the moment in the West, so it is harder to do a move there. 
even if you've done the irrelevant move, which some people might want, it's not necessarily a guaranteed upgrade. We haven't seen irrelevant in Worlds type scenarios, so we don't really know how he'd play, to be fair. Um, the Han Sabo one's an interesting one, because I agree on that one. That is a tough one. If I bring some, like if I bring Kazi in, it would obviously depend how he's going to like synergize with other people. But put it this way, even though I don't think Han Sabo necessarily played badly, I do think personally, though, uh, it, after seeing him for this long in G2, there's two things I think are the case. One is I do think he is clearly someone who has to be played around uh, most of the time, yes. which isn't always the case for other people. I, he's I, also I not meta proof. I mean, yeah, he his inability no. or lack of, dis or, you know, unwillingness to play Zeri has been a big part of G2. I mean, it's a big part of why they lost to, uh, why they lost to Mad Lions. And I also do think he is someone who it can be a little bit fragile. Like, as you're saying, when it's a bad meta or things going bad, I think he can just, the arse can drop out of his game. Whereas normally I expect ADCs to have a higher floor to that game. So I don't know, it's a hard one to make a move though. I mean, also because you got the T1 factor. Like, in the same way as the thing that makes it hard to change the roster if you're T1 is you do still get these clutch wins out of nowhere. You have, like, a game that looks better. You do that in G2 as well. It's never really gotten true. I mean, they're still winning it, Europe. You know? Like, yeah. And it's not particularly... The, the problem is it's not they, particularly they close. Won, they could have won this game, mate. Even with the hard draw, yes. they still potentially could have gotten out. So that's why yes. it's so hard, yeah. Uh, so it, it really does feel like a risk where you're reaching for a better international performance. But what, you know, my, my question for you, Thorin, is like, do you think it's reasonable to believe that you could win MSI or Worlds as a team from Europe in this era? Because that's that's the only like you literally they literally finished fourth place at MSI this year, which was an excellent finish. And they played very well. Is is it worth the risk of lowering your floor to see if you could actually reach a top two or top one at an international event. Here's what the people risk don't want to hear, though. This is what people don't want to hear, Monty, is that they want to believe that if you do it, you have to do it with this G2 team or this TL team. You have to have teams that have good synergy and chemistry and people get along and there's no big deal. No, here's the problem. I think the worst thing is if you want to actually beat the Asian teams and win the championship, the number one thing you obviously have to do, and this is what no one wants to hear, is you have to build around generational talents. So you got caps, Maybe you got what Mickey X like uh, are the others generational talent. I don't know. That's why if I'm me, I'm going for like I'd say a Raz Orc. But I think because if you look at the G2 super team that did it all, or even the Fnatic one from 2018, that's some of the best players to ever come from the West. Bro, even on the bench of the sort of Fnatic team was so hard for fuck's sake. You had Reckless when he was still good, you had Caps when he was becoming amazing. Like, I, I don't think you can do it with just good teams. You need to also like get the talents of the rich. So, for example, if you're TL, I don't know how you're going to make this work, but you probably should have tried to get a Blabber or a George or something like that. Like, you need like someone who's not just good. He's like can transcend the region. I think the same thing with G2. I think Caps is really good, but I think I would have one more like carry type player in there, like another super duper player. So, you're going to have to gamble to do it. You are right, by the way. You could obviously make the floor lower for the team. You might not win domestically as much, but to me, like, I think both these teams showed it in their own way. G2, I don't think actually looked like they had good enough early games in this tournament, so they could never get in a position to fucking win. And then TL, for me, didn't have the hands to edit. They didn't have the, they essentially had the style to beat a lot of people. They didn't have the knockout punch. They didn't have, like, the, the factor that wins and closes the game at the end. So I think both these teams, they're totally different ways of building, but I do think, unfortunately, I think you have to be cynical. It's why if people don't get it, I do fight till the end for the people like the opposites of the world. Even some of the ones I know are a bit of idiots, like fucking self mates. Because the difference is, Monty, when you see them actually like engage their hands and you're like, fuck, we've got a chance. Like, that's at least a chance to beat these Asian teams. Whereas, like, uh, the obvious example would be like Super for Mad Lions. I actually think he did in the end show he's pretty good. And actually, over the years, so sure he's got skills. But can I ever see him going head to head with Viper in a BO5 and winning it? No. <laughs> that's just no, isn't it? Like the yeah. difference is, you uh, might think upsets are egotistical. The difference is, you could imagine a world where upset could even get lucky in three out five games. It's it, plausible, it, you know what I mean? It just, it just feels like Thorin. We're in an era now where even the Asian teams are having to assemble rosters of generational talent True. to win worlds. Yeah. Right? Like we're not gonna. If you look back in the history of League of Legends, we don't look at teams pre twenty twenty and be like. Wow, this team had all of this generational talent on it, right? It, many of them didn't. Fucking T1 was winning world championships with like Bang and Wolf. Like, come on, man. Like, Samsung White was winning worlds with Looper. FBX was winning worlds with Gimgoon. Like, come on. 
like look at what Genji had to do. Look what BLG had to do last or J JDG had to do last year, right? Look at what we had to see Genji do this year to take a stab at it, right? And sure, T1 won last year, right. but they do have generational talent. Like, Kerry and Zayas are generational talented players. Sure. Yeah, and yeah. Guma's very good. Is Guma one of the ultra elite AD carries? Probably not. He's probably a step below. But he's definitely good enough. And Owner, when he turns it on, Owner's had a very good Worlds again so far. When Owner is in form, he's very, very good. Um, and so... We are, and they have also the most decorated player of all time, clearly. So they do have obvious genera generational talent on T1. So when people are like, uh, I don't really know if we need to change anybody on G2, I agree with your take, Thor. And like, it, they have to be better. They have to be more of a super team. And the GMing has just been so bad that people have been unable to like assemble those super teams. I don't know a way you could say that this iteration of G2 would be worse with Razork. Like, who the fuck would say that? That's a crazy thing to say, right? I'm sure it's worth a try. You know what I mean? But you you, you must, it must be better, right? It, it must be better in order to compete because the stakes are higher and it is just much harder to compete with the Asian teams who are trying to put Canyon and Chovy together on a roster with Keen, who you may not think is good, but Keen has been one of the best top players in the world for many years. He just has a style that doesn't cover him in glory all of the time, right? Keen is a generational talent. He's a generational weak side player, period. So it's tough. Like the, the level, uh, the number of stars that you need. And then on top of that, G2 just has a harder row to hoe because they have to get that good in a region where their opponents are way shittier than in China or Korea. So how do you do that? You know, that's, that is possibly the most difficult thing. If you could take this G2 roster and put them in LCK, I think they could do very well. Like they would improve a lot, but that's not going to happen. So you need a high, you need somehow to figure out how you're going to get a higher concentration of talent within this G2 team. Uh, and that's tough because they're already so far ahead of everybody else in Europe. And here's the other angle, Bonte. We've seen two full years. It'd be one thing if it was like we only saw a year of that. We've seen two full years of this life. What's going to change in year three? Are we really? Yep. Is, there, is there another level they're going to say? I'm sorry. I think it's the opposite. I think in league you already get a year or two with each roster. You probably have to make a change eventually. Like I think you've tapped it out. I think you saw. Look, one thing you have to say about this team is the floor was very impressive. They survived all metas. They went to all the international tournaments. They almost won every single bloody title. Like it's all very impressive stuff. But even that internationally never did get you the wins you wanted. Though you never really got the deep finish that you were. You didn't even have one. You almost did it this MSI, but you didn't. So for me, it's the other way around. I go, look, you had your chance, you failed. Like, there's bands that have their time and it doesn't work out, and there's teams that have their time and it doesn't work out, and there's politicians that have their time and it doesn't work out. It didn't work out, time to move on. Because here's the other reason why, Monty. I'll give you the obvious example, and it is T1 last year. I'll tell you what, T1, I think if you could go back in time now, of course you make roster moves. You should gamble for it all. Instead, G2 could do the same thing, Monty. Right now, they have the whole European scene on lockdown. But if they sit back and do nothing, think of all those people we said that are like free agents this offseason. Someone else can make the team that now even might beat G2. That's the other reason you have to sometimes make moves. You're in the driver's seat. You can take those pieces if you want. And I, I, look, it sounds like Razog's just going to stay in for that and he's going to run that fucking team back somehow. So maybe it's not an issue, but I would be taking him. So there isn't a Razog that could beat you in a final or something. There's another reason to do a move. If Yike goes, he goes. So be it. <laughs> I, so be I just it. think, like, Yike is... He's not good enough. Like, and I, I wonder if Hans is, is versatile enough as well. But the, the other issue is just the GMing jobs have been so bad in Europe that G2 can't level up based on scrimming opponents that are worthy of their attention or worthy of their skill. So I, I think they're in a they're in a tough position. And if they're they're not able to go and boot camp in a different region before Worlds because Worlds is in Europe and they just have to stay there, how are they supposed to get better? I don't know. You know, it's an unenviable position for sure because I think G2's talent exceeds that of its region and there's no way for them to basically hit the next level there's no re and perhaps there's not even a way to reasonably test themselves to think about who they should replace on this roster 
because I feel like they haven't hit their limit yet because they have such a short amount of time period to play against very good world-class teams. And oftentimes they do show up for those matches. They really do. So it's it's just depressing because I want G2 to do well, but I just don't know if if it's a combination of their domestic opponents or the potential lack of like superstar status at every single position that's going to push them to actually get a result that everybody would be happy with. Because what doesn't what I don't understand, Thorne, is people are mocking them for their fourth place finish at MSI as if that was bad. To me, that was an excellent result. It was very, very good. They really finished above top eight spots. Yeah. And, and it was a double limb tournament. Super legit result. I you know, one thing about MSI is that the format makes it conclusive. We can just say they're the fourth best team in the world. It's very, very difficult to argue with that. It feels like when MSI finishes, because it has a good format, you can say like, okay, we understand what the world order should be. When we finish Swiss stage here, when we finish Worlds, it's never clear as to who the best team is. It's incredibly frustrating. Like you left with so many what ifs as a result of this shit format that like, I, I'm not convinced that JDG wasn't the best team in the world last year. I'm not. I am very convinced that G2 was the fourth best team in the world at MSI. But until we actually get a better format for Worlds, these questions are just going to be left hanging. Um, and that's depressing. Oh, but there is another thing. If you just look at that bracket and then go, it's the upper bracket of a double limb tournament. We're cooking, <laughs> boys, what we're talking about. We're cooking. Whereas instead, this is going to be good, but it's not the same, is it? Imagine if that low bracket was there. Imagine. It'd be glorious. Yeah, I mean, and and based on current form, it's not outrageous to say that Top is the best Chinese team and Korea and Genji is the best Korean team, and they're on the same side of the bracket. T1 is leveled up. Like T1 is a team that they appear to be increasingly comfortable with this meta. Uh, obviously, they were able to take out BLG, not in the most convincing manner, perhaps, but they bounce back. They, you know, owner and Zayas play extremely well against G2. Uh, owner looks like he's very much on form in this tournament. Faker also has some kind of quietly low-key good games. Um, but this is a tournament that has been powered through their jungle and top lane. Um, so T1, in a, good, in a very good position now, I think. And they should be able to continue to adapt to this meta. And especially because we know that the more we see Nocturne, the more it's going to play into T1's favor because they love Nocturne. And they have for years now playing owner on T1. Um, they're very accustomed to this. Nocturne Nico, Nocturne Ori. This is fucking T1 bread and butter right here. So they should there's be very happy. A world, there's actually a world where the semifinals really just is that. Like, it's. I don't think you can go wrong with the bottom one. Because it's either TES Gen G, which will be fire. Or it's just the rematch of T1 Gen G. That would obviously just be, like you say, it could be the record-breaking match. Get all oh, the people yeah. in the world to watch. Like the tension will be... In. By the way, if you're a T1 fan, if you just win that one against Chovy, all the bullshit narratives get to start up again. <laughs> all the rest of it. The thing is, I actually do low-key think that the angle here is, if somehow Top Esports wins Worlds, what a mega run they'll have had. T1 into Gen G into who the fuck knows from the final. If they can win, <laughs> that'll be a mega legit. Winner. And I can already tell you, get ready, because if he's doing the game, fucking kind of Captain Flowers or Medic's going to hard force like a, one of these, like, you know what they say? The cream rises to the top, and cream and top are on top of his spot. Go and fight Call of the Year or some shit. Just get ready. Just get ready. There's something to be churning in the LPL. It's not cheese. You know, it's like that. whatever. I'm not, available. Not, going, not for, like, going for the cream in your pants angle here. That's, that's not a bad one. No, in, 2000, in 2004, that would be the angle, of course. The childish. <laughs> Whack angle back in the day. <laughs> Uh, well, what we're saying about Team Liquid and uh, G2, I think holds true, which is that there's some sort of missing factor that's preventing them from doing well on the international stage. But what's not missing factor is our show, Summoning Insight. And thank you to Factor Meals for sponsoring us here. Always appreciate it. And you, unlike 
you know, TL or G2 can feel a sense of victory by engaging in Factor as they deliver you prizes every single week. Up to 30, they have 35 different meals that rotate so you're never bored. They have Gourmet Plus with some more premium ingredients for you guys. Keto, calorie smart, vegan, veggie, whatever you want. Options for you from Factor. And if you are very busy this fall, Maybe you're back in school or back at work after a summer vacation. Well, here you go. Make your life a little bit easier. They, it's all pre-made, never frozen, fully cooked meals that their chefs make for you. All you have to do is pop in the microwave for two minutes, get a healthier option than getting takeout, also significantly cheaper. All gets shipped to your house in a box that has cooling packs in it. Just put it in your refrigerator, eat it over the week. It's great. I've used it when I was in the States. Really appreciate it. You can also put... Tons of add-ons, protein shakes, breakfast items, all in that box with you. So it's not just the lunch and dinner-esque meals you can get. There are other options as well. You can head to factormeals.com slash LFN50 and use code LFN50 to get 50% off your first box and 20% off your next month. That's code LFN50 at factormeals.com slash LFN50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. Don't be like G2. RTL without that factor. You can have the factor right in your house. There you go. Thank you to Factor for sponsoring us here at Summoning Insight. We appreciate it. And we appreciate you guys when you buy from our sponsors because the best way to support us is to support our sponsors. And we try and get you guys some good ones that you like. You've been generally quite appreciative. So we thank you very much for that. And that is a good service we have actually tried before we're even sponsored by them. So, yes, indeed, Factor, we in good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, alternative smoking there. We also have some upcoming sponsors that I'm very excited about because some of these new sponsors I have actually bought products from years ago and now they want to sponsor us. So I can literally just talk about my own experience with some of these products. Um, Factor I have used. Uh, HelloFresh was obviously one I used. Same company as Factor. They just do the the meal kits as opposed to the pre the pre made food. Um, I had used them for a, a year before we got sponsored by them. So thank you guys. For supporting us, we don't try and sell you guys things that we don't use ourselves or enjoy ourselves. So there you go. Um, yeah. So what else? What else do you want to talk about, Thorin? You want to do some predictions for yeah, the quarterfinal it. matchups? Because it. it's going to be. I I don't know how not straightforward this one is. We've got a couple of them that I think you know. Well, actually, you know, I actually think a lot of these could go either way. Now that I consider it a little bit more deeply. Um, but it's, I God, I just wish we had double limb. I just look at this and thinking about double limb again, because, <laughs> you know, it just, it feels wrong that either HLE or BLG is going to be eliminated in quarters. Same yep. with top esports and T1. I would really like to see some more games from absolutely all of those teams. So a bit of a bummer that it's going to come to a conclusion so swiftly. I will say this isn't the I on my stream I might end up doing totally different bets because I'm I do the bets based on the numbers. But if we're sure. just doing based on the overall matches, look, I do think LNG will beat Weibo, but I do think of all the teams, Weibo just has. They still do. Even when they play badly, they have like a clutch factor to them actually, that they somehow just stick around in games. They can always sort of get back in them. So oh, that's a bit no. scary, but <laughs> I hope it'll just be like a clean three one LNG. I just can't or, believe in crisp, man. Get them out there. Just get them out there nice and clean. <laughs> and I just think LNG is the sleeper for this time tournament then hanwa against blg right all signs say i should just pick hanwa just be oh just my are you, are you just I, night standing again out of control i'm, a masochist. <laughs> I'm gonna say somehow blg wins no this one. night is gonna be the shit i think bin will finally get it together and i think actually the difference is peanut's gonna be like all oh, trying to brain draw jun's just gonna be in his face the whole time so it's all good blg comes out <laughs> wins that one three two crazy comeback from two one down mark all this down they get through fuck hanwa zika you're out you're at, you deserve to win this one but you don't get to win because that's how life works tes against top i'm so uh t1 against tes i'm really scared because i do know there's a factor where like the clutch factor engage but i just hope it'll be like a 
a boring TES 3 0 stomp, just smurfing from bot lane onwards from five minutes. So, in. That's an easy one. So, and then so, Gen G, I'll get, I'm actually going to say FlyQuest inexplicably wins a game because, as you say, <laughs> Gen G just starts playing with their food. The way Paul like, trips over and face rolls the keyboard, it got to combo off, <laughs> and they actually win a Baron fight and win the game off that, in spite of it's a Baron. There you go. There's all your predictions. So you've got, your, you've got the 3 0 LNG. We're going with the 3 2 for BLG. We're going with the 3 0 for Top Esports. Then we're going 3 1 Gen G I against mean, FlyQuest. Look, I think this, the scary thing about Hanwha Life, Thorin, is that we haven't seen, like, a terrible peanut performance yet, and we're always just bracing ourselves for those at an international oh. event, uh, which does make you nervous. Also, Bin has been very good throughout Worlds, despite Billy Billy's problems, Bin's individual performance, and the Jax meta that is engulfing us currently is concerning, right? Now, some teams, what, T1... Um, T1 did let both the Ari and the Jax through and managed to find a way to beat it. But I don't think that's going to be a very replicable situation for a lot of teams. And that was also before they made the roster switch and owner really dominated. But like, I think if you look at this and you're like, oh, well, we've got, we've got Peanut here and he's going up against Jun, like, and Doran versus Bin, it just feels like such a Bin-sided matchup, especially because Doran, throughout playoffs, was very reliant on the Jacks himself, and they're probably going to have to ban it. So it becomes, to, it's like, is Doran just going to play Gnar in these matchups, right? Um, given current bot lane form, you give the bot lane edge over to Hanwha Life. But Zekka, he's great in this meta, man, but is he as great when he doesn't get the Yone? Is this when the he's Silas starts clapped. coming That's out again? That's gonna clap him. <laughs> That's gonna clap him. Po quite possibly. And he's got the champion ball. <laughs> so he's just player for player. You look at this and you think, okay, probably BLG has advantages in the solo lanes, and then maybe in jungle if Peanut runs it down. But Peanut has been really good so far at this event. Um, so. Maybe that maybe Peanut just like actually having a good international performance will push them. I also the just top. can't handle that the guy who makes all his teams choke is called Peanut. For fuck's sake! It's two on the, the nose. It's two on the nose. I know. I mean, exactly. The problem is Monty. In theory, he's a great lightweight snack, but he can be dangerous to certain types of teammates if they don't already know what conditions they have. It's too much, mate. It's too much. It's too much. It's yeah. Too on so the nose. I, I I am really concerned about Hanwa in this high pressure situation, because this is where people like peanut and Doran have typically folded. And also BLG in these extended series and LPL has really come alive in like best of fives. And they have some days now to hopefully fix up some of their macro, but HLE has been the better macro team at this event. Yeah, of course. As for top esports versus T1. I mean, this is, this is fun because both owner and TN have been performing at a very high level throughout this event. 369, maybe a bit more wobbly. So you you put it in Zayas's favor. Cream over Faker, obviously, even though Faker did have a couple of R games to like close out his Swiss stage. Um, and I despite Mako not having a very good like end to his summer split, I do think like Jackie Love and Mako have have enough to kind of push them over the top. But Tien, when Tien has been on at tournaments. When he has been Dade awarding, he has been bad from like game one of Worlds. He has yes. just had terrible group stages in the past where he completely griefs it. He's not doing that. He's been the best. I think most people would probably agree he's been the best jungler overall at this event so far. So I don't think he's like suddenly going to step on a rake when it comes to quarterfinals because it's not like the pr it's it's never been an issue of pressure performances for Tian. Whereas Peanut, it absolutely has. At times, international pressure performances are what sends Peanut down. It's when he gets to quarters, when he gets to semis at Worlds that he starts to, like, have these choke performances. Whereas Tian, it's like, if he's on at the international event, he's just, like, on. Or if he's off, he's, like, really off. And he's been on, so I don't think there's a reason to believe that he is going to have such a bad time. Uh, you might point out to, like, T1 beating him at Esports World Cup. Well, I think Top is a better team now. Than they were at Esports World Cup, and I don't really rate Esports World Cup as a that great was like three measure. Months overall, and yeah, a different meta as well. Come on, yeah, and also just to point this out: Top went home and immediately lost their next few matches before going on a tear. Top also, you know, they had some they they did have some good meta reads, like they were playing like Ezreal, Trist, Ivern at the time, 
and like using the iron brushes and using range, you know, the iron brushes to mask their their double ADCs. But we're not playing in that, you know, T1 kind of downloaded that and then and then like there what the top esports kind of ran out of strats where I think now with top they they feel more versatile to me. And you know, Cream is still going to be there able to play on this on this Yone which is one of his like all-time signature picks but he's been really good as well in the Aurora. The question is does he get either Yone or Aurora anymore and then at that point in time what's kind of the next rung down on the ladder. By the way, I want to ask you about that. It actually sounds like people basically picked the wrong aspect of the patch to go mad about because remember everyone's initial take was like it's all going to be all like Oriana's here in the and it hasn't been like bro if anything it's the other way around it's the Yone and shit like that all the time now. So like, you actually have to have like the str the other picks like the Oriana's like the backup pick at this point in time. Most people thought coming into Worlds that Yone would be the the highest pick ban champion. So I think that turned out to be true. The problem with Aurora Thorin was it was just disabled for most of domestic playoffs. So nobody played it. And generally the rule, guys, going into playoffs is you cannot play champions that are disabled during playoffs. But it was because of a bug that Aurora had with Chrono Break. So it's sometimes, I guess, when Aurora was in a game... You couldn't chrono break that game if there was a pause or another problem where you had to reset, so they had to disable her. So she was in in domestic playoffs available in the initial stages, like the early parts of playoffs, played a couple of times, then disabled for the rest of playoffs. So we actually haven't seen very much of her at the professional level. Now, if you're asking me, Thorin, she should be disabled for Worlds. Like, I don't think that this champion, because there were the the, the she was disabled so quickly. They didn't get the information they needed to potentially balance her at the professional level. Not that they would have see Yone, right? Just they, they didn't bother to balance him at the professional level. Uh, but I think you cannot have this champion just running around at Worlds when teams were not able to pick it or play against it uh, for the most important and indeed the majority of domestic playoffs. So to me, this champion shouldn't even be around right now. And it's kind of ridiculous that it is, but it is very strong. Uh, and where Cream goes as he goes further down on the ladder of his champion pool, you know, he thrived in a ADC meta that has fallen off somewhat. Uh, you know, he was playing tons of Corky, Trist, Zeri, Lucian. Like those are his foremost played champions of summer. Um, and at Worlds, he's been fortunate enough just to play three games of Aurora, Lucian, and, and Yone. He's not going to get those champs anymore. Like, the meta has evolved and the pick ban phase has evolved. Then unless you are FlyQuest versus Team Liquid, where people apparently cannot fucking play these champions, uh, you are not going to get them, probably. Um, they're just not going to make it through bans. I mean, you probably so, have to play Silas and shit like that, right? Yeah, quite possibly. Um, so I think that's, that's a question about cream is just his, he was very, very dependent in a recent meta on some of these picks. Um, and historically in his career, he's been a good Ari player. Like we know him as an Akali player as well. We know him as a Silas player as well. So there are some champions that are meta right now that he can default to. But the question is, given what he has been playing almost exclusively recently, is he going to be up to snuff on that? And his top esports going to be able to play around that because they've been playing well with double AD carry for so long. Like, do they have it in them to kind of switch it up and go for other styles? Is my question. Question is, what is Faker going to play? Nico and Oriana. <laughs> and Ari. Just a million games of that. Yes. <laughs> like, and then do the flex on to carry us with the Nico potentially. It, it, so it is a very powerful red side pick for them for that reason, because Carrie is really good at it. Uh, I think for T1, we're coming up on probably some Caitlyn Lux games now that, sure. you know, that's Probably. been unleashed and teams that play Callista uh, are have to be punished. And that is a good way to punish them. And T1 is the best team in the world at running Caitlyn Lux comps. So I anticipate from T1, we're going to see Nocturne. We're going to see more Nar, probably more Gragas. Uh, I don't think Zeus is going to play Jax. He'll probably just keep playing the Gragas into it and the Nar into it if possible. And we'll see heavy emphasis on Nocturne, heavy emphasis on Nico and, and Oriana. That's what I anticipate. 
uh, their priority is going to be. But the thing is, you just can't ban, you can't ban Faker out, right? Uh, that's not going to be a good choice for you because he does have enough. He, if, as long as he can go like three or four champions deep, it becomes very difficult. Uh, to deal with him, as well as banning other champions that are necessary. He's played Yone at Worlds. He won that game. His domestic Yone games were bad, um, but he won a game here at Worlds with it. Maybe he's gotten better on it. Uh, but really, you can't let them have Yone because, again, that's a Zeus pick. So Zeus has always played Yone. Zeus is amazing Yone. You can't let him have Yone. So T1, in spite of not maybe having a great mid lane Yone, are still a threat with Yone. And that's the problem. Also, Faker can play Aurora, I'm pretty sure. So you have to ban the Aurora. So he probably gets some, he probably gets Ari, Nico, Oriana, Silas, like these picks. He'll, he'll, he has enough of depth of his champion pool that he's not going to get banned out. By the way, what do you think about the fact that a whole bunch of the Asian teams are super horny to draft the fucking Skada every time it's available? What do you think of it, that? It's incredibly good. Uh, so I question this when. Gen G was really uh, prioritizing this in the LCK playoffs because they were doing it while a lot of the Asian teams weren't. And it seems like they were just really far ahead of the curve. The thing about the new Skarner since the rework and since they like kind of buffed his quality of life with the way that his Q mechanic works is that he's just so strong, right? In the in, He offers so many things that you want in many of these like as a professional player, right? He gives you interesting pathing choices with his E. You can bypass wards. You can gank very effectively with him early. He becomes very powerful late. But I think honestly, Thorin, a lot of this is that the meta has moved into a lot of dive compositions at Worlds. And the thing about dive comps is that Skarner is one of the best anti-dive champions in the game because he could just right. multi-man ult you when you come in. Um, and... He's great into Nocturne. You know, as we see Vi, Nocturne, Yone, these picks really start to dominate. The Skarner pickup becomes very valuable. And that's why we see a lot of it in terms of first picking. Is he... He's not a primary engaged champion. He doesn't have non-committal engage. So he can't just, like, fish for an engage with a... Like a Sejuani ult or a Leona ult or a Maokai ult or these abilities. But because we have a lot of other champions that have non-committal ults at playing at the sport position, Nautilus, right? Um, or you have other ball delivery mechanics uh, for a champion like Oriana that aren't necessarily Skarner. Uh, he does provide very strong, you know, follow-up engage. And he's very good at kiting. And he's very good at ganking. So there's a lot of factors. Uh, he's also just very good at uh, objective control because you can ult enemy junglers and it's never a 50-50 because suppression is one of those very rare mechanics in League of Legends that will block smite. Um, and it's like Malzahar ult and like... I know it's and, what actually tilts the fuck out of LS that so many teams that have oh, to yeah. fucking don't properly do like the Barons and all the shit. It's really bad, isn't it? It <laughs> I is, mean, it's ridiculous. It like when you when you have this mechanic... And it's like yeah. only suppression that can stop you from casting smite. And it's like only on a very, like it's a, what on Malzahar and Skarner. Is that it? Off the top of my head. Um, you have to use it and it's on the jungler. So the, it's not like you have to rely on your mid laner to do it at the right time. You know, when you're pushing smite, just fucking ult the other jungler. Like it's not a 50, 50. You should not be able to get, objectives at 50 50 if they are in the pit with you and your ult is up as skarner like that's not it's not acceptable <laughs> it's not acceptable so i think i think this is there's a lot to like about this pick right now and canyon and gen and the rest of gen g were definitely like ahead of the curve with this one um but now we're seeing it just be first pick worthy the question thorin is is as the meta evolves on red side do you have to ban yone aurora skarner do you even have any other bands? I mean, Yone and Aurora definitely feel like you just have to, don't you? The so is Skarner now? Uh, is Skarner now at that level? Is my question. It's an interesting question. In like what's available, yeah. Because By the way, can... I actually do think the metric at this world is pretty good so far. It's pretty. That's, that's yielded good games. 
interesting yeah, yeah. comp. There's, there's been a, a fun amount of versatility, I feel. Um, quite a lot in bot lanes. That's underrated how many different picks are on it. There's a lot of ADC picks you can do right now. You know what's crazy, Thor? And it's almost like you can pick a lot more ADCs when you can lane swap. Isn't that weird? <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Who knew that that might be the truth? Uh, it does limit top laners in certain ways uh, because you have to be able to, like, deal with the 1v2 situation. Uh, but in terms of bot lanes, it does make you able to respond, I think, better to enemy compositions by having the opportunity to lane swap. What do you think so far is the best style to play in this meta? What do you think has been rewarded the most? Um, so it, it really, I think now we're moving into a phase where it is like dive versus anti-dive, uh, where anti-dive is going to start probably winning because when you blind pick Skarner, it limit like it just gives you such strong anti-dive that it becomes very, very difficult to play dive compositions into Skarner. Um, but the thing about doing that is if you don't have a form of primary engage, you have to have objective priority. So you have to be the first mover on a Drake or a Baron because you have no real way to muscle in sometimes if you are like a pure anti-dive comp. So if you're running it without like a big primary engage or a big non-committal engage, it can be a bit tricky. Uh, so there's a possibility that these compositions could get outranged. Um, what team do you think that helps the most? How do I life or smart? I mean... I mean, unfortunately, the answer, one of them is probably Gen G. Okay. Uh, because you're playing with a lot of poke compositions and, and Chovy has significant versatility um, in that department. Uh, it sounds like it's bad for T1 potentially. Well, T1 can play control mages, so it might not be. The thing is, okay. T1 doesn't even really need that. What's dangerous about T1, Thorin, is they're still maybe the best pick comp team in the world. And sure. pick comps are very good right now. So... The, the thing about T1 is that they usually do not, they will only take pick situations and man advantages. They set up for the pick so well that it's very hard to stop them from doing it. That's why they're so fearsome because it's not like they're trying to play a front to back five versus five where they're trying to dive your carries. They intercept your carry before you even group at the objective. And that's what makes them fearsome. So, not for the sa the the same reason, but I think T1 is empowered at this event. And I think you can see that because people are complaining about Vi, but I don't think people are complaining about owner playing Vi because owner's Vi has been really good. But it is it is a major strength of T this iteration of T1's rosters for the past three years that their pick comps are really good. And the way they set up for them too, you've got Vi, Ari, Jin. These are all huge picks for owner, faker, and Guma. Ash for Guma, another one. Like, a lot of these pick composition champions just fall squarely into T1's wheelhouse. Um, so they're going to be good. I mean, the thing about T1 is they will be good during the bracket stage. I'm very confident of that. Also Gragas allows you to isolate targets. But T1 is is very uniquely good at some of these champions. So. Yep. That's that's kind of what I think of the actual meta game that's evolving. Um but like I said, I wonder if Skarner just ends up joining a, a list of must bans because it 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 feels like when people want to play Nocturne, being able to not deal with the Skarner is pretty important. And it's almost like, I just don't think it's often wrong to be one Skarner blind. He's he's just too good right now. And also, another thing about Skarner is that there's a lot of burst that's happening. And once Skarner gets to a certain point, he's very difficult to burst down because he has a heart steal and 4,000 HP. Um, so, how do you actually kill this guy? is a question that we're seeing in a lot of compositions. Like if you go back to FlyQuest versus Team Liquid game three, who is supposed to, is it is Kled or Kaisa supposed to kill this Skarner? Like that's, that's not going to happen. 
you know, whose who's, who's job is it to kill the Skarner is becoming a more and more relevant question. Or even game one, where FlyQuest versus Team Liquid. They're literally playing Skarner into Syndra Jin. Who's killing that Skarner? Is it Jax? Here's my hope for the Jax playoffs. can't kill Skarner because when Jax walks up to him, he gets impaled. When I said the meta was good, I'm also thinking towards the end of the Swiss. I don't want to see any more games of that smolder shit. Just knock that on the head already. Get rid of that. That's, I don't that's the will. past. Get rid of that shit. That was the beginning of the Swiss. It was bad. Get rid of it. All the other picks I'm in for. Like the Yone is good. <laughs> Fucking, yeah, let's go for it. Silas, I'm glad that's so, my RE picks could be mega for some of the best players. You should, you should love this then, because if anything, Fnatic proved why we're seeing a lot of deprioritization of the smolder pickup, Thorin. Because top esports just fucking played a super up tempo game of turret pressure against the Smolder that Fnatic was running, and they just beat them in 24 minutes. Right? Smolder suffers in those early game scenarios, and he cannot keep up with map pressure with a lot of these other compositions. And it's not like top esports was doing it with Caitlyn Lux either, they were doing it with MF. And they, Jackie was just always in lane, always pressuring. Now, MF is good at doing that because she builds BT first and therefore is always full HP and always pushing lanes and is very, very annoying. Um, so you can do that with MF. But I'm just saying there are other comps you could probably do it better with. And they just completely rolled Fnatic. Um, so the Smolder picks, like, I think are going to fade out over time. I don't think that Knight's uh, Jace pick was the answer. In fact, I think Knight was like 5-0 and and barely doing any damage on Jace. So I think like Jace probably just fucking sucks right now because even when you're super far ahead, you can't do enough. Uh, so there was a danger, I think, in that PSG game, um, even though they rolled the early game super hard. But also we we continuously see... You know, Kaisa be a threat to Smolder. Kaisa is a very high priority pick. Can you just slide into the back line and assassinate the Smolder? So I do think, I do think Smolder is going to go down. And if anybody was going to play Smolder, shouldn't it have been Gen G into Hanwha Life? Because a lot of people were playing Smolder into Yone, and they just let Zeka have Yone, and they didn't pick the Smolder. So I think that's kind of the evidence you need in certain ways, is that if Chovy's not playing it into Yone. Who who is going to do that now? And I think teams have demonstrated that they're able just to like really push advantages. So, I think probably fortunately, I hate Smolder, so I think that fortunately the Smolder the Smolder days are behind us. The real terror me meta would be the Smolder Yumi meta, by the way. <laughs> Who wants to see that though? That's just garbage, <laughs> isn't it? It's just trash. I mean, Gen G wants to see that. Lehens wants to see that. <laughs> He's a sick fuck though. <laughs> I'd rather see him play Blitzcrank, but he fucking loves that Yumi. What can you say? <laughs> uh so yeah, I mean, I think I think maybe D plus could get away with it because it's more of a flex for them and because they needed aiming to be on hyper carries, but most team styles I don't think will be that affected by this. Um, so anyway, any final thoughts on quarterfinals? Some good ones coming up. <laughs> I'm excited. We finally get into the meat of the tournament now. These, these are the matches that we've been hoping to see in terms of best of fives, and we'll be seeing them over the next couple of days. Uh, by the way, guys, I think we'll probably cut viewer questions tonight because Thorin's under the weather, and I have also, my voice is dying because I did VOD reviews of all nine games that happened earlier today. Uh, but good news is we got plenty more shows left for worlds. And also this show's going in the off season. So we will have plenty of time to get to all your questions. We are running this show all the way to cover roster changes, historical topics. So also this is a good time. If you are a subscriber, you guys have had good ideas for historical content in the past. Now is a great time to plant those seeds in our minds and maybe we might, you know, maybe we'll put a twist on them or something like that. But you guys have had good ideas. So if you, if there's a, a concept, maybe we'll do an entire episode of your 
historical hypotheticals during the off season where we can do a, a deeper dive into some of them. But if you guys have those ideas, let us know and uh, we will attempt to bring them. Subscribe to, you. to the subscribe to the Last Free Nation Discord. You can put them in the questions channel. That's right. So we will see you guys obviously at the end of quarterfinals, and we'll be here all the way through playoffs and beyond for you. So catch you next week.